Okay, we will come to order and call the roll, please. Council Member Hasco? Present. Council Member Husky? Present. Council Member Taylor? Present. Vice Mayor Wernickoff? Here. Mayor Alt? Here. Okay, um, our first item will be oral communications. Anyone who wishes to address the council on an item not on tonight's agenda may do so now. Again, anything not on tonight's agenda. Does anyone wish to address the council? Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Good evening. My name's Rob Jack, and my comments are in regard to the ASCC. There are two vacancies on the ASCC, and there have been for some months. This creates a problem with finding a quorum, and it creates a serious problem with site visits. And recent site visits have been either not held or been canceled. So I would like to ask the town council to make this a priority to complete the interview process and there are people who are interested in serving on this committee and make a selection of the best qualified people because I feel strongly that the town requires a complete and fully functioning ASCC. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I see one hand up on Zoom and that's Rita Combs. Rita, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Thank you for taking my comment. Uh, first of all, I wanna congratulate you on having the system, well, kind of working because right now I'm seeing my name. I'm not seeing um, the panel. So I don't know, it may have been uh, disconnected at this moment, but I had sent a, a a message to Howard earlier, looking for a document that um, uh, Council Member uh, Hasco had mentioned last week about something from the fire department, the Woodside Fire District. Is that document going to be sent to the residents of this town? Uh, it sounds like it was a, something that was a concern and wanna know if that document will be um, part of uh, this information that the you need for the uh, documents that are up for approval tonight. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Um, thank you. Um, we, we've had communications with the fire district. They'll be covered during the item. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Christy Corley has her hand up. Christy, go ahead. Thank you. I am wondering who the town clerk is or who the temporary town clerk is. I did write Cara earlier today. In the absence of the Patola Valley town clerk, who is responsible for town official, who is the responsible town official for ensuring compliance laws and conduct of our town council meeting tonight on 329? 23 and future meetings in the town. Who are residents to contact if we uh, have town clerk questions as normally I would ask uh, these questions of the clerk. What laws and regulations govern the proceedings and votes for the general plan amendment? Does the housing element vote pass with a 4-1 vote, a 3-2 vote, a 5-1 vote? Does the ISMND vote pass with a 4-1 vote, 3-2 vote, 5-2, whatever? Please explain all scenario limitations and guidelines. Um, and then how will the council recusals be organized during the meeting tonight for each vote brought to the town council? Uh, for example, um, council member Hasco and council member Wernickoff, there was some talk of that a different voting process would occur, and I'm wondering how that would occur. I also agree with ASCC comments. 
We have applications. They have been submitted for a very long time. And I'd like to see the two positions and vacancies filled as well, as long, along with group uh, meetings for ASCC to meet with the applicant so everyone can meet at one time and open to the public as well. That was up for discussion at the last ASCC meeting. And I remember going to lots of meetings and I do appreciate being invited as well. Thank you. And I don't see a timer when I just see my name. So I'm not okay. seeing what I need to see. Thank you. Okay. I see no other hands up. Uh, there's a hand up here in the, in, the, in the town hall. Go ahead, Randy. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, I apologize for the written submission uh, shortly before the, the meeting. Um, so I'm just going to read um, part of that. And the, and the the key part is a request to to postpone the vote on all of these. This, this relates to in, this. This is oral I, comment is for things not may, on the agenda. That's not, on the agenda. I may not be able to stay until the late hour. The last one went until until we have your we're in receipt of your letter. Um, the, there are other things I'd, I'd like to address. They're not on the agenda. You can talk about. I've I've been told that we could make public comment at the beginning. And then, and it's not on the agenda. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This look. This I'm trying this happened. This happened with the frog pond. I've been interrupted in my public comment in previous in previous meetings from the previous night. This is not. This I'm just not following right, the rules. If you're commenting on the housing element, well, you have to call it go to that section. I'm you, sorry. you can't discretionarily apply these rules. I'm, I'm making my comment, and part of it you may think is related, part of it may not. I have other notes here. Okay. And please continue. I mean, this, the, and I'll just skip to those because I saw this type of thing happening with the frog pond problem, with the frog pond uh, issue. And Ford Field was up during that issue. And, and, there, we need to move past these problems and we have the opportunity to. And this is such an important issue. What I'm asking is to try to settle all the substantive questions tonight and then give the, the town a chance to digest those and to ask our questions. And it's been said to me that, you know, the problem here is that, is that the ad hoc committee or the town didn't, or the, uh, the council didn't bring the residents along. It, it's not just that, this is such, an important issue. I mean, it certainly is that. I think, uh, I think that the town has a lot. We have lots of questions about about the issue. You know, what's right? What rights would developers have during this two-year sunrise? If fifty units aren't identified during those two years, is can can HCD automatically purchase the development? Um, are these addressed right. right. in, in the documents? Is the post implementation plan where a lot of our the protections are now put? Is that submitted to HCD? Um, and we haven't we haven't allowed an alternative path to to emerge. And that's I I, I just I, I really worry about the precedent we're setting here in moving forward with approving these tonight, especially given all the technical problems that happened last week. And even now, I don't know how much longer I have to speak. <laughs> so I, I mean, I appreciate um, the the chance to say this, but you know if. If we don't zone our parks and our open spaces for development, then it, it's my understanding they can't be developed even by builder's remedy. So this, you know, this I am suggesting that we draw a line in the sand and commit to not developing the parks and open spaces. And that should have happened after the whole frog pond debacle in 2018 and 19. And the the you know the problem is the same process for choosing the ad hoc committee happened again. And there were similar governance issues during from that committee that, that I've heard about in the last 38 hours. And I'm happy to elaborate on those, but there is a path here and it can happen quickly to, to do a process where the residents get the, 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 to provide feedback and ask questions. And, and we have a, a, a good governance around this key, key issue. So I please, Ask, beg you to to postpone this. Ms. Alette, um, those of us who've been involved in this, there's, you know, there's a letter from the, the fire marshal over there that, that that I would like to read, and I, I know you're going to address. But there's there's so many substantive issues, and only some of them have even been voiced publicly. So, thank you. 
Thank you. <clears throat> I see a hand up on Zoom. Sue Lo, go ahead. Sue, you might need to unmute. Okay, we will come back to Sue. I just want to point out we are taking comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Through the mayor for a yes. sec. I think you might tell people, I mean, the next item after this is going to be the place where they, it's not going to be way late. Right. Just, I mean, just to make it clear to everybody, I know, I know you're just following the rules, but maybe okay. just clarify for everybody that literally it's the next item and we're going to take public comment after a staff presentation. So it's yes. going to be public in like- comment on the mm. hearing will be you know, shortly after the staff presentation will last maybe a half hour and we'll go from there. So if this is not on the, on about the, is this, is this something not on the agenda? Um, my name is Wilson Ferrar. I live up at 4 Russell Avenue in Craig's neighbor in the area, many of you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my father, Kendall Farrar, who is a resident of the town and of the state of California, he's 89. <clears throat> we grew up outside of Boston and uh, my father was town selectman. And I, in fact, myself uh, started a run for US Congress several years ago. So first of all, I wanna thank you all for, for helping us govern our town. I know that you're under tremendous pressure. And I know that you're under tremendous pressure from some powerful people coming from Sacramento. Um, we are here as your neighbors and your friends. And um, we appreciate the opportunity to speak and I'll we'll speak later as well. But right now I want to say thank you. We're here in kindness and goodness. And we want to work on this together as um, your, your uh, neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, mm. Sue Lowe's hand is still up. Um, Sue, if you want to comment, please unmute. Okay, I'm not seeing her on mute. So um, we'll move on to CC. If you're hand up, you may speak. Yeah, my name is uh, Jay Jernick, and I just have a, uh, a request, particularly of the uh, mayor. Could you speak a little louder and into your microphone? It's hard to uh, hear everything that you're saying. Thanks a lot. Will do, thanks. Okay, I see no other hands up. We will move on to our main agenda item, which is a public hearing on the adoption of resolutions regarding the initial study and mitigated negative declaration and the adopted, adopting the proposed housing elements. Um, our planning director, Laura Russell, will be presenting. Hey, thanks, good evening. We are back to um, an older microphone, so please let me know um, if it is picking me up okay. Give me just a second to share my presentation. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much. Good evening. Um, as mentioned, I'm Laura Russell, Planning and Building Director. Um, if you haven't been to these meetings um, before, I think most of you know me by now. Um, we're here this evening to consider adoption of the initial study mitigated negative declaration called an ISMND and the MMRP, that's the Mitigation Monitoring Reporting Plan for the housing element and the general plan amendments, and also consideration of adoption of the housing element and general plan amendments, and to get final direction from the council on the post-adoption plan. I am joined as always this evening by Cara Silver, town attorney, and by Adrian Smith, our senior planner, um, is our key staff team on this. We also have our lead consultant, Curtis Banks, from Urban Planning Partners on the Zoom as well. So the meeting purpose this evening um, is number one, to receive late breaking comments from the fire marshal. Um, we received um, comments late this afternoon, which have been copied and left in the schoolhouse. They've also been given to all of the council members on the dais. 
So we're going to go through that and um, we're going to give you a recommended um, optional language that you may want to consider in a resolution should you adopt the ISMND this evening. We're also going to give you a refresher on SB9 and a comparison to the opt-in housing program. This is in response to a request from the council at the last meeting. We are going to look at a final review of the ISMND, including a final proposed language for an addendum to the MMRP based on previous conversations, and then consider as a consideration of adoption of a resolution. And then we also have prepared for the council's consideration a resolution for the adoption of the housing element and the conforming general plan amendments. And then we also anticipate council discussion of a final process or mechanism for implementing the key approaches to fire safety that were brought forward by the fire marshal at the February 15th planning commission meeting. So as a reminder, um, there's a process FAQ and a table of meetings that's available online. Um, we are now at, we have held 40 public meetings on the housing element process in a total of approximately 140 hours of public discussion. So this is language um, that has been produced by the attorneys representing the fire district and with review by our town attorney. So this is new language and we can come back to this later on, um, but there are a series of measures that the fire marshal would like the council to consider. And those are the ones that were distributed late this afternoon, um, just before this meeting started. And so we have responded to this in the best way that we um, are able to with, uh, with the language that we have um, from the fire marshal so far. And so what is suggested is that if you wish to approve the ISMND this evening, this could be an additional clause that would be added into the resolution. And the gist of it is that the process, the town is in the process of updating the safety element. And during that process, the town commits to actions requested, uh, permits, I'm sorry, um, that during this process commits to address these actions um, requested by the fire marshal from the planning commission's meeting. Um, and then also from the email that we received today. So these are the seven items that were distributed. Um, at the last minute to the council. And there's further language in here that the council intends to adopt the safety element on or before with the idea that the council could add the date in that section. And then further language, the council anticipates the new safety element will contain fire prevention programs and policies, at least as protective and the as the 2010 safety element. And that safety element, the new one, will contain a timeline for implementing those programs and policies and with the um, schedule that's in there so that those things could be um, implemented in a speedy fashion um, with a date that would be like the deadline for implementation of those. Then the final language as um, requested by the fire marshal is that the town will also adopt the Moritz map as a basis for evaluating the fire risk associated with specific sites in town. So we know that it's um, always challenging to deal with late breaking information. Um, we're doing our best to transmit that to you and to um, provide potential solutions for solving that. We anticipate that there'll be further discussion um, when we get to the discussion portion of the meeting. And we can certainly bring this slide back up um, if people wish to view it later. So now we're moving on to a council request that we got as an SB9 reminder. Um, and to try to give a comparison to the opt-in housing program that's in the housing element. So this is a slide that many of you have seen before, if you've seen previous presentations on similar topics. This imagines an SB9 project where there is not a lot split. So there's no division of land in this example. In this case, we're imagining a site that's less than 3.5 acres because that's a cutoff and most of our properties are less than 3.5 acres. You can imagine that there's a primary house and the size of that house is limited by the town's AMFA, adjusted maximum floor area. So that's the floor area according to our local calculation. That house may include a 500 square foot maximum size junior accessory dwelling unit under state law. 
And then also under state law, a property owner could add an ADU that's a new detached ADU. And that ADU can exceed AMFA by 800 square feet. It can have four foot side and rear setbacks under state law. If it has the reduced setbacks, it would be subject to the more restrictive standards that the town has put in place to protect privacy and light and fire safety in those conditions. Also under state law, that property owner could have an SB9 unit. That could be a new unit that's either attached or detached. It can also exceed AMFA by 800 square feet and can also have four foot side and rear setbacks. Again, if they use the reduced setbacks allowed under state law, then they'd be required to meet the town's more strict objective standards for design and for fire safety. Then here's a little comparison between SB9 and um, the opt-in program. Just a second. So one of the biggest differences between an SB9 um, project under state law and a similar project under the opt-in program that's included in the housing element is related to flexibility. And there's flexibility in unit sizes in the opt-in program. So under SB9, if the, if the unit complies with the town setback, then the maximum size is 1,200 square feet. So by definition, it really has to be smaller than or subordinate um, to, a, to a larger house if there is one on the property. In the opt-in program, each unit size is not regulated. It's flexible within the floor area limit. So people would have the option of mixing up the different unit sizes um, to create a different variety of unit types. In terms of floor area and SB9 unit, um, the town must allow an 800 square foot SB9 unit that exceeds AMFA. The opt-in program as drafted includes a 1600 square foot bonus above the normal AMFA that would apply to the property. Similar in terms of impervious surface, the town must allow enough impervious surface to accommodate an 800 square foot SB9 unit. So if someone came in with an application that was just over the limit, but that amount was required to meet basic requirements for things like building code, um, fire access, or basic entrancing, then we'd be required to approve that. The opt-in program includes a 1600 square foot bonus in impervious surface. Related to height, um, if a project uses the state setback of four feet, then an SB9 unit is limited to 16 feet um, maximum height. And um, many of you are familiar, we have two different types of height measurements to take um, consideration for properties that are on a slope. And so in the case of an SB9 unit, both are the same number, which is the maximum um, basically is as strict as we can be under state law. If the SB9 unit complies with the town setback, then the height can be taller. Um, this is the same as for an ADU. It can be 18 feet vertical height and 24 max overall height. In the opt-in program, their proposal would be, um, since you have to meet the setbacks of the base zoning district, you could use the height that's associated with single family homes. So in most zoning districts in town, that would be 28 feet vertical height and 24 feet maximum height. So here's an example. Um, this is just an example graphic of what might be possible in an opt-in housing diversification program project. So again, there'd be no requirement um, for the primary house to be the, a specific primary house. You could have unit sizes that vary. All the units would comply with the town setbacks, but you could have a variety of the unit sizes. So this is just an example on, on a one acre lot, these numbers are approximate, but um, in this diagram, you could see two smaller attached units at 1200 square feet each, and then two detached units at 2200 square feet each. So this gives you a sense of how that floor area may be allocated. So this floor area is 1,600 feet higher than what would be allowed for a typical single family home on the same size lot. And as a reminder, the purpose of this program was to emphasize a variety of housing types and to have um, just a sprinkling of a few more units spread throughout the community. 
The idea was that it would be a good way to accommodate multi-generational housing, more retirement opportunities, perhaps a co-op or other situations where people may wish to live in town in a smaller amount of square footage. You'll recall that there was quite a bit of discussion um, at the past couple of meetings related to the um, topics that came up from council members Taylor and Hasco related to a post adoption plan. Um, so we referred to that as the colleagues memo or the colleagues presentation in previous, previous conversations. And so there are two topics from that plan um, that have been incorporated into the MMRP as additional policy measures. Um, and that's included as an addendum. So behind the MMRP, there's um, the abbreviations and then there's the tables that come out of that plan. Um, it's presented in a very simple form based on the legal counsel's recommendation. Um, staff has filled that out in a very minimal way. Um, so that's the recommendation that we got on the best practice of how to do that. Now moving on to the errata to the housing element. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with this type of process, this is pretty common when you're working on a big advanced planning document and you're starting to get towards the end of that process. So we have um, housing element draft number three that's been circulated in the community for a while. That's the one we've been talking about. And then in the staff packet is an errata. And those are the proposed changes to draft number three. So that's what the council is considering in terms of the latest amendments. So when you have the errata, we have not included all of the small typographical or clerical errors. Um, the normal assumption is that the council would authorize staff to make any typo or clerical errors. And then these are the larger um, that have uh, issues that have more policy questions or provide more clarity that we wanted to make sure the council is aware of. So um, all the language is here. This is all included in the errata. This is attachment to the staff report. I'm just gonna go over some of the highlights and then I'm gonna talk in more detail about the gateway and the sunrise concept. So the first set of changes um, that's in the errata come from the planning commission recommendations. And then we have a series of changes that came from the town attorney to provide additional clarity to one of the sites. And then we have um, the items related to the gateway and the sunrise. So the planning commission has recommended language change related to Dorothy Ford Park and open space, um, language change related to how we're referring to the gateway classification in um, some of the tables and in some of the language, clarifying the zoning um, classification or density for the multifamily. Um, so we're making sure everyone understands for a while it was five units to 20 units per acre. And now the proposal is for three units to 20 units per acre. Then we've got a revision to the density of 4394 Alpine Road site. Um, and that's the same thing, just clarifying that we're going down to three units per acre and up to 20 units per acre. And then after planning commission discussion, revision of the development standards for the Ladera Church housing site. This is the one at the edge of town um, next to the Ladera Church itself. The planning commission suggested that the housing element note that state density bonus law may be applied to that site to put residents and members of the public on notice that it could be possible that those development standards could be altered by state law. Um, moving on to other items, uh, there's clarification for 4370 Alpine Road related to the ephemeral creek and drainage, um, the setback for that. Then the opt-in housing diversification program, the planning commission recommended a change in that language to be more specific to what was um, being trying to be achieved in the program. And then um, from the town attorney, there is clarification in the supportive housing overlay development standards for 4394 Alpine Road. So this is just to bring up some or to address some questions that came up um, while we were reviewing that in consultation um, with the property owner and through the legal team. So now we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the gateway in the sunset um, concept for the Dorothy Ford Park and open space property. Um, the gateway designation as drafted includes both the Dorothy Ford Park and open space 
and the Ladera Church site across the street. Um, but the primary focus of this conversation is related to the town um, Dorothy Ford Park and open space site. Happy to take any questions on that if there are any remaining. We've talked about that quite a bit in the past. So we have made some proposed amendments to try to address the feedback that we've received from the council in the past, as well as how we understand the intent of the planning commission. So we have um, created a new program 2-3. Um, we have taken items that came from the Taylor Hasco colleagues memo and integrated them with other elements of the council's discussion and tried to put this together in a way that HCD can understand um, the town's intent, um, but um, kind of strike a good balance in terms of what language we're providing to them. So we've taken some items directly from the Taylor Hasco colleagues memo. Um, and then we've added some things to that as well. So in this new program, um, the things that we wanted to note were the second bullet that the town would begin tracking existing or newly identified sites and noting any legal safety or other impediments to including such sites in future housing element updates. So this speaks to the interest of starting to plan for the future and having more of a continuous and proactive approach to looking at housing sites. But then we also added this last bullet at the end um, that says to the extent additional housing opportunity sites are identified through this program, the development of such sites would be prioritized above the use of the Dorothy Ford Park and open space. And then this program would live directly above um, the next program, which is um, program 3.1. So visually, these would have some connection when you're reading the housing element. Um, it's hard to tell in the errata, but when you look at the actual draft document, we think that these will tie together well. So program 3-1 is existing. Um, I've just added this language here to remind everyone that that one is to initiate a site planning process for the sites in the gateway land use classification. Um, and the intent there is to um, make the most efficient use of the property and to preserve open space. And then this goes on to say that it anticipates an affordable housing project in partnership with an affordable housing developer. And so the time frame on this is the main thing that has been discussed on this program. The Planning Commission recommended moving it ahead by one year um, after discussion. And so that would mean the site planning process would begin in January of 2025. This would be just the preliminary site planning where you start to think about what is the community process going to be? What types of studies are we gonna to have to do? What would be considered? Um, have other sites become available? Um, is fundraising necessary to try to preserve open space? So this would just be the very beginning of exploring all those different options. And then the next step is issuance of a request for proposals and RFP to affordable housing developers. And right now that is listed for September of 2025. I've been asked if these dates could be moved more. Um, and my recommendation is that they could be moved a few months more, um, but I wouldn't recommend that these be moved significantly beyond that um, so that we can still demonstrate feasibility of this housing site to HCD. And then the third piece that staff has proposed in the errata is new language in section six. So section six is where we talk about all the different housing sites in some detail, and there's a written narrative description for each of the sites. So we're proposing this new language at the bottom of the page. And so we are trying to indicate here in this language um, the important uh, trade-offs that happen in a community like this. So we're noting that it's a highly valued open space um, and that we recognize that development would result in a permanent change to open space, which is contradictory to other town policies. And that the town is seeking to balance its affordable housing goals and obligations with the longstanding open space ethos of the community. And as such, the Dorothy Ford Park and open space is included in the site inventory and detailed in program 3-1. The town will proceed with development of the site as outlined in program 3-1 unless another confirmed feasible site or program can achieve the same number of affordable units within the planning period. So we think that these three changes in combination 
um, reflect how we understood the intent of the Planning Commission and the Council um, in addressing this area. And we are hopeful that this approach would also be um, acceptable to HCD. We have included for you a self-certification table. Um, so when council adopts a resolution um, adopting the housing element, this is an included piece. And we're saying that the housing element complies with all aspects of housing element law. And we're making that finding as a town prior to HCD certification. So staff has prepared that self-certification table, the findings, and that's based on a template. Um, you saw it in the packet, it looks like a template. Um, these are the, the same kind of approach that other communities are using. We actually filled it out in more detail um, than some cities and towns have um, so that we can try to really demonstrate that we have met all the requirements of the law. We do want to note, though, that use of this process is legally untested, um, but we do consider it to be the current best practice, and we have included it as because it's a potential legal argument if the town receives a builder's remedy application before the housing element is ultimately certified by HCD. And turning again to the post adoption plan um, that has been proposed by um, council members Hasco and Taylor. And so it includes um, all of the topics um, that were discussed previously, and then those topics three and four have been added to the MMRP. Um, and the council members have proposed that this plan be adopted by the council within 30 days um, after adoption of the housing element. Then turning to the key approaches to fire safety that the council has been considering um, over the last couple of months, these are a different list of items than what came from the fire marshal and was distributed today. Um, so the staff analysis that's included in the staff report and following up on the discussion late at the last council meeting is staff's analysis is that we can really put these key approaches into these following categories. We think that there are a number of them that would be very appropriate to put into the post adoption plan. And we think that those are um, these numbers here, number one, two, three, and five on that list. There are two items that are either completed or well underway, um, number four and seven. And then there are a number of them that are largely addressed, we believe, in housing element programs already. And that's numbers six, 11, 12, and 13. And then there are three items that are really only within the Woodside Fire Protection District purview. Um, so the town doesn't really have authority to require anything. We're just waiting um, for them to interact with the town on those items. And those are number eight, nine, and 10. So staff's recommendation um, following the logic of your previous actions is that council make a motion to adopt numbers one, two, three, and five to be integrated into the post adoption housing plan and then to direct staff to work with the fire marshal to develop a shared work plan to address all of the other approaches. So the idea here is that we could invite the fire marshal to a council meeting to discuss these items and give him an opportunity to elaborate on some of them that we don't have a lot of detail on yet, and then perhaps prioritize that through a council discussion process and then the council could forward those policies onto committees, um, maybe particularly the um, Wildfire Preparedness Committee and the Emergency Preparedness Committee for committee input and an opportunity for community input. Um, and then those items could come back to the council for formalization of the work plan. We might also go to their board of directors um, if invited and if appropriate to talk with them as well and make sure that we're well coordinated. Um, uh, we were requested by a council member to provide a cost estimate of implementation of the housing element as drafted. So we've provided a table that includes the director consultant costs where they are known and our best estimate of the staff effort just in a general high, medium, or low category. We want to emphasize that this is a preliminary and high level cost estimate. 
Um, and we also wanted to emphasize that this includes the housing element itself. It does not include the post adoption plan. Um, most people probably realize, but it's worth saying that implementing the housing element itself is a significant undertaking and the post adoption plan will require additional staff and or consultant resources in order to carry it out. We would anticipate based on Council's direction um, that we would finalize that plan and start to work up budget numbers and presumably integrate that into the town's annual budget process. So in terms of next steps, um, if the Council um, adopts the ISMND and the housing element, then staff will incorporate the changes that are included in the errata and anything else that's directed by the Town Council. We would correct typos or clerical mistakes. We would put that all together. And right now, if approved tonight, we would submit the updated housing element to HCD by Friday. Um, we are proposing to do that because there are state laws um, that change. And if we don't submit by Friday, um, there, there's yet another item um, that we have to include in the housing element. It's relatively minor compared to everything we've done so far, but worthwhile um, to try to get that in by Friday to avoid that um, additional thing we'd need to add. We anticipate that HCD will take a 60 day review period um, to look at our revised housing element, and then they will either indicate to us that they intend to certify it or they would issue another comment letter. My understanding of how this is going is they let you know if they basically intend to certify it. And sometimes there's just a couple small changes that are not worthy of a full comment letter. And then you just make those small changes and then they go ahead and certify. So that's what we have in front of us in terms of the housing element itself. So that comes to the end of the staff presentation. Um, we're very happy to try to answer questions. Um, as I indicated, we know that it's challenging when items come um, late. We try to avoid that, but in this case, we were not able to. And so if we can provide any assistance in your discussion regarding the fire district's um, comments, we'd be very happy to try to do that. So that concludes our presentation. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Um, <clears throat> we will follow our usual um, procedure, which is council can ask questions of staff and then we'll take public comment, and then we'll follow that with council discussion. So are there council questions for Laura or for the rest of staff? Mary, any questions? Well, I have a numerous questions. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who tried so hard to bring me up to speed on, on this uh, housing element. Um, one of the things, uh, easy questions maybe, um, this SB9 that uh, we're looking at right now that in your example, um, there, uh, I wonder, we have a current example uh, in development. Uh, I wonder about septic. How are you going to do with that kind of uh, high density on places where there's uh, no sewer? Um, and is that being accounted for in, in these building things? I thought SB9 had something to do with being a corner lot and thereby you could have four different units, but I guess that's not the case. So those are my two questions there. Um, and are the current units that are being built under this SB9 and opt-in uh, counting for our, towards our arena numbers in this cycle? And then what are the other questions that we have? Uh, one is- uh, can I, I'm sorry, to... can I answer those first? Yeah, it's gonna because... be too much soon. It's gonna be very soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, first, SB9, do we have any current applications? Um, right now, we have received one application total um, for an SB9 project. It is a new house that includes an ADU and an SB9 unit. So that's the only one we've received. It's actively being reviewed right now. It's anticipated to go for the new house to ASCC shortly. And then the SB9 unit has to be approved ministerially um, with just a building permit. Um, there is not a relationship between SB9 and corner lots. So there's no, it doesn't have to be, it, it's, there's no relationship there. Um, SB9 units, when they are, when the building permits are issued for them, they do count towards our RENA. SB9 units count towards RENA in a similar way as ADUs. 
So when the building permits actually are pulled, then it counts um, for reporting for that year. However, um, HCD has been very strict about whether we can use SB9 units to project what's gonna happen during the housing cycle. So they will benefit us if they are actually constructed, but we're not able to include them in our projections for what we think is gonna be built. Um, to my knowledge, they have only allowed communities to include SB9 projections if they have a documented history of a lot of SB9 applications, and we only have one. So that would not count as a documented um, history of units based on our information. Then in terms of septic, um, there could be challenges on some properties, um, not being able to accommodate the septic system that would be required. And so um, they would not be allowed to build at the den that density. So the septic is, is sometimes the driving factor of how many bedrooms and bathrooms um, can be built in a house. And so that could be a limiting factor for, for opt-in in some locations. Um, or you may have cases where they would have to connect um, to the sewer and then the cost of that would be borne by the applicant. Okay, I'm ready for the next set of questions. Shall I, can I respond to the, can I ask a further question? So that sure. Just finish saying, yeah. Um, that means that HOAs, CCNRs can be overruled completely by the, right now. Like the four foot setback, the, uh, that you were talking about, the, uh, all those things that are CCNRs protect the community. The codes, covenants, and restrictions that govern our neighborhood are, will be completely eliminated by, by, the, by these applications. Well, um, ADU law specifically addresses this, and um, ADU law trumps local HOAs. Um, SB9 units do not trump local HOAs but I wouldn't be surprised if they change that in the future because they changed it for ADUs in the past. Um, and then for opt-in, um, our local setbacks would govern. So you wouldn't have the option for reduced setback. Okay. Um, and, and that applies to trails, for example. The codes, covenants, and restrictions that grant trails. I'm, I'm not sure of the connection about trails. Could you say more about that? They're, they're within a four foot setback. If they're within the four foot setback, you can't have a trail within a four foot setback. So when we drafted the code language, we specified that the setback is to be measured from the trail to make sure that there was at least the four foot setback from the trail to the new ADU or SB9 unit. So, um, yeah, so that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to everybody's time, but I, I think that some of the trails are governed by the CCNRs and some of them are held by the town. And if the CCNRs are being overridden, then they won't respect those trails. Uh, I believe the way that we have it written, if there's an easement, they still have to measure from the easement, regardless of if it's a private or public trail. Thank you. Thank you. That is it's one piece of right when they become more than that. Um, Okay, and, and these currently being considered units would be part of the unit numbers that we're looking at, right? Yes. Okay. Next question was, um, I'm not too hard. Sorry, <laughs> I am sorry about this one. Uh, the, the, I have an aversion to the gateway concept. So the gateway to language and the gateway concept. I think it uh, is it, uh, it flies in direct contradiction to our uh, the ethos of the town to have a development called the gateway that in a quote oak open space uh, it it it's, it's it makes a joke out of our housing element um, in my opinion. Now I could say that more elegantly, and I actually have written it up more elegantly, and I will say it later more elegantly. But the question is. Where did this come from? Where did the word gateway? Is this, a, is this a standard practice of planners to put a gateway at the beginning of communities? A gateway development at the beginning of communities? Um, not necessarily. This was a direct recommendation from the Planning Commission. The 
call it a gateway. Yes. For a particular reason. Um, I don't, I mean, maybe the folks that were on the planning commission at the time can speak to this. Um, I just thought that they interpreted it as a um, pleasant term to suggest that the site was going to be developed, but in, if it's developed or then it would be in the most conscientious way that still respected the open space tradition and still had a feel of welcoming people to the community. So I interpret it as positive language that was suggested by them. Thank but you. Um, okay. Uh, was it still possible to add Dana to the sunset? To the sunrise oh, provision? Sunrise. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's in a different situation because um, it's privately owned. And so the reason we can do it for the Ford Park and open space is because the town controls it. And so we don't have to do any zoning changes right now um, since the town will have the authority over it later. Okay, um, okay so the um, last question is what the additional thing is that we're gonna face if we don't pass it tonight. Oh, um, <laughs> It's really technical. The state um, keeps making changes to the way that cities are required to regulate um, different types of homeless shelters and different types of supportive housing. So I believe um, this one, Cara might need to speak to it, is related to how we regulate those types of uses. And so because we've already submitted our housing element, we're grandfathered in. But if we don't resubmit our housing element, then we would need to add another program that says that we're going to do a rezoning to catch up with state law um, for those types of uses. Don't have to do that now. If we turn it in by Friday, we don't have to do that. Okay. It's not a horrible thing. It's, in my opinion, it's not a horrible thing. Um, it's just being in compliance with state law and adding additional programming. Um, but we recognize that when we keep changing the housing element, it's hard for everybody to keep track of where we are. Thank you, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Greg, before you, um, I forgot to read the conflict of interest. But before you, I'll get the answer. Um, <clears throat> tonight's agenda item on the housing element and related documents will be segmented to permit the two conflict, conflicted council members to participate. We will conduct this hearing similar to previous sessions, and this is a summary. First, we will have a staff presentation. We will then take council questions on all items except 4394 Alpine, 4370 Alpine, and 4388 Alpine. And those are, um, those are the vacant site next to Roberts, uh, the future site of Willow Commons, and the office park at the corner of Alpine and Nathurst. Uh, we will then take public comment on all items, and then we will um, we will entertain council questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, council members Wernickoff and Hasko will recuse themselves, and we will take council have questions and discussions specifically on 4394, 4370, and 4388 Alpine. Um, when that is finished, we will uh, the council members can return to the dice, uh, and we will uh, <clears throat> conclude the discussion. Go ahead, Craig. Thank you. Um, one of the public comments was whether we could substitute SB9 units for the opt-in. Is that possible with our program? You know, sort of a, I don't know, a, a similar to the Sunrise, this idea that you might be able to do a substitution if there were SB9 and, and have fewer opt-in. I think that was the intent of the public question. And I was interested as well, so I brought it up. So if um, SB9 units came in, then we would reduce the number of units in the opt-in program, like reduce it down from 12? I mean, I think that was the question. Is, is, is that possible within the housing? Um, I think this is a very interesting question. I think it's probably possible if we... Yeah, I think it's probably possible. Okay. So 
but we can have more discussion on it later. I just yeah. want to get a sense for whether it was, you know, just not possible at all, but it sounds like it, it might be something worth discussing. Too. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, on the Maritz adoption, and I realize a lot of this stuff is coming in, you know, literally at 626 p.m., which is pretty much under, just barely under the wire. Um, I'm a little confused about the idea of adopting the Ritz and then applying like Cal Fire regulations to it. That sort of feels like apples and oranges. Am I misunderstanding? And, and you may not be the right person to ask this question to, but, but I'm finding it kind of confusing. I mean, I get the idea of Maritz um, and that it's got a set of um, areas that are colored for different levels, but it doesn't seem to me that there's a direct correlation between that and Cal Fire's um, different, you know, high and very high. And it seems like people are starting to conflate those. And I'm just wondering, am I missing something here? Um, I view it the same way you view it. Okay. My understanding though, is the fire marshal may view it differently. Okay. Um, I don't know, Cara, if you can speak to anything that you, um, the conversations with their team or their attorney today. <clears throat> um, so I think that the one clar clarifying uh, point to make is that under the suggested language proposed by the fire, fire marshal is that the Moritz map um, shall be adopted and um, would serve as one consideration of the fire risk for selected sites. So um, certainly the Moritz maps, um, uh, uh, description of vegetation is something that is at a more granular level than the Cal Fire map that we currently have. And so I think that it would be appropriate for the council to consider the, the um, Mort's map for that um, purpose. But the language does not require the council to consider the Mort's map exclusively. Okay. Um, and then if we got additional maps, I mean, I know Cal Fire, I mean, not Cal Fire, but Woodside Fire is working like the flame mapper and stuff. If those come in and they're in conflict with the, the other maps, do, where, where does that conflict get sort of resolved? Is it, we just have both of them to look at, but we can, as a council, can sort of decide between them, or is there some other way that these things get, and I'll say adjudicated, but I mean that in the loosest sense. <laughs> So again, we were we were negotiating this this language up until the last minute, and that would be an important clarifier, I think, to add to that particular recital. Um, there is no discussion about what happens with the subsequently adopted map, but presumably they will um, essentially preempt um, all all of the older maps. Okay, great. Because I mean, hopefully, we're getting you know better information as time goes on. Um, okay. Um, Laura, on the SB9, so just remind me, like, you can subdivide a lot, but like, how many, can just once or multiple times, it's depend on the size of the lot, we kind of lost track. I know we've talked about this in the past. You can only subdivide once, okay. and then you can only build a total of four units where there was once just one, there was one lot with one house, imagine, you can subdivide that, build two units on each of those lots for a total of four. Or you could build three on one lot. Is that 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 would be the SBU, the SB9 unit, the ADU? I'm just trying to understand. What no, not the way that we wrote it. We wrote it in the most strict fashion. So they'd be limited to two units on the resulting lot and they cannot have the ADU. Okay. So that would end up being quote unquote a main resident and an SB9 unit on the, each of the subdivided lots. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um I know we had talked about this last meeting and I, I may not have seen it. So this is just a question of, have I missed it? Um, we talked about in the Ladera um, church about the right setback being zero. Um, and we were gonna put some language in that it was gonna be zero with permission of the two property owners, which as long as it was the church, they could obviously say yes to themselves. But if it ever changed hands, we wanted to make sure that the church outside of Portola Valley still had the reserve the right to say, no, we don't want a zero setback. Did, is, did that get in, in the stuff someplace or did I miss that? Um, I might have missed that and that would be an appropriate addition. Okay, yeah, because I know we've talked about that for other stuff, you know, when we were doing some of the Willow Common stuff, 
as long as both property owners agree, then it could be a zero. So, okay, thank you. Um, are there any other um, penalties for not getting something done in 60 days after January 31st? So you mentioned this additional program we'd have to do. Are there other things that kick in? I, I was on, and again, I've in some ways been going at this, I've kind of lost track of which penalties apply when. Okay, so the one that I mentioned that's by the end of March, um, that's that small one right. um, that we were just talking about. Um, then there's a series of requirements that are related to when you have to complete your zoning. Okay. Um, but we are already hoping and planning to complete our zoning this calendar year. Um, so those are not as much of an issue. So right now we are in the ballpark of the builder's remedy consequences and legal action by housing advocate consequences. Okay. Um, so that's where we are right now. I don't, I don't think we would anticipate any attorney general or any other action like that for a little bit longer, okay. um, but that's an unknown at this point. Okay, so some of the fines and other things, unlikely given the current political environment, but builder's remedy and, and lawsuits our, our potential, the, the longer you're sort of out of compliance. Uh, yeah, any, any, any day, any time. Yeah, um, right. Other okay. cities have already received lawsuits and builders remedy. Perfect. Um, and then the last one is, I was a little confused on your um, adopting the topics that we talked about last time. So just, I wanna make sure that we're clear is, there was a set of topics, I think that we as a council agreed on them as principles. And then what's gonna happen within 30 days is a more detailed plan. Is that your understanding as well? That's my understanding. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. That's it, thank you. That's it. Here. Uh, I think it was probably an errata, but your slide on gateway said sunset. <laughs> was it sunrise? Yeah. Okay, no problem. That's not the first time I've done that. <laughs> Understandable. Um, when you showed a slide on the program or section six, this was about having confirmed and feasible alternate sites. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Feasible has a certain meaning to HCD and there's guidance on that. And so that's what we're alluding to there. Where that's a nod to HCD to say that we know that any other sites or programs would have to be feasible according to their requirements. And confirm. Um, if we have to do an amendment to our housing element, um, which is a possible consequence of the sunrise, um, then they would review it and give us their opinion about whether the other site was feasible. So confirmed by HCD? Um, potentially confirmed by HCD, yes. It's a little bit of an unknown whether we would have to resubmit to HCD or not. But we wanna be prepared for that possibility that um, using the Sunrise provision, we would have to resubmit to HCD and have them deem the replacement site or program to be feasible. Okay. But from your perspective, is that word confirmed necessary or are you just giving the public a heads up that there might be a confirmation step? Trying to make sure everybody knows that it has to be a real site that has, for example, um, if we found another site, we would have to have owner's permission or authority to make application. So that's the kinds of things I was trying to capture with that language. So my remaining questions, and we might want to, I don't know when, because I think others will probably have some more questions, is the late breaking proposal. I'm very confused on what is binding, what we are binding ourselves to. And so it would be a combination of showing us again the proposed resolution. and probably Cara or I'm assuming leading us through what we're what we would be committing to if that resolution were adopted because you know frankly some of these references 
I don't have the history for. And if we're committing, you know, irrevocably, I, I, I need to understand what, what the implications are. So would you be able to put up the resolution that you flashed up earlier? I definitely can. I guess the question is, is it more questions or is it more discussion? I'm asking someone to explain what we would be committing ourselves to. If you want to talk about it in terms of the discussion, that's fine too. But it, to me, it's a question. Yeah, it's a question. Okay, so this is the language, and um, Cara, do you want to address? Sure. So the, the um, genesis of, of this comment is that um, over the past year, uh, town staff has been meeting with um, the fire marshal and the fire chief to discuss a variety of different um, fire initiatives. And so there are things like updates to the fire code, updates to the home hardening ordinance, um, uh, updates to the um, setback requirements for building, adoption of the fire maps, et cetera. And so the discussion was, um, where do we hurt all of those initiatives? And the fire marshal wanted to make sure that as part of the housing element process that there, he, he was not losing the opportunity to um, make sure that these initiatives are incorporated into the community. And um, there was a recognition that these initiatives are, um, going to require some time to flesh out and so he wanted to to codify the commitment of both sides to work on those initiatives and he wasn't necessarily um, dictating a particular outcome um, but he wanted to at least ensure that we have a process for um, implementing these these measures and having that community-wide discussion so that's the background. The, the first, this, what is being recommended is that we take the um, initial study MND resolution that the council is required to take or, or adopt before adopting the housing element. Um, and in that resolution, we have a series of recitals on what actions have been taken in connection with this whole process in terms of the planning commission um, reviewing the MND and the February 15th meeting where the fire marshal and the planning director had a dialogue about the, the key fire approaches um, and some of the other initiatives that the fire uh, marshal has recommended over time. And then, um, so, so what, <clears throat> we are suggesting is that after that, the recital dealing with the February 15th meeting, I'm just saying this for context, that the, um, uh, that we insert an additional recital stating that the town is in the process of updating its house, if it's updating its safety element, and that during that safety element process, um, we will a commit that the town council will commit to addressing the actions requested by the fire marshal at the February 15th hearing, which is those seven key fire methods, fire approaches. I'm sorry, 13. Oh, the, okay. the first, the first set's 13. Okay, 13. The key fire approaches, and that also we will the Town Council will commit to addressing the, the um, letter that was submitted today by the Woodside Fire Protection District's attorney, which lists seven additional um, um, initiatives. 
And the and the these additional initiatives are, I would say, are more specific than the thirteen sort of broader principles. Um, so the commitment is to address those um, and address them through the safety element process. Um, and the fire marshal also wanted to make sure that there was some deadline for um, addressing and completing the safety element. So he has requested that the town council commit to a deadline for adopting the safety element. Then third, um, the fire marshal is requesting that the council, uh, there's a recitation that the council anticipates um, that the new safety element will con contain the, the prior or the existing uh, fire prevention programs and policies that are in the 2010 safety element and that um, we will con that we will agree to a timeline for implementing those um, uh, fire prevention programs within the new safety element. And again, he is asking that the council uh, uh, provide a date for implementation of those, of those new measures. Um, and then finally, uh, as we discussed before, the town council is committing to also adopt the Moritz map as part of the safety element as a basis for evaluating the fire risk associated with specific <clears throat> sites in the town. And as you recall, the 2010 safety element specifically adopted the Moritz map. Um, and so the fire marshal wants to assure that um, the current safety element also adopts that map. And again, that's I assume under the proviso that if there is a more up-to-date map, that that's more up-to-date. So part of this is pretty high level. We're in the process. We commit to this at a high level. What I'm trying to understand is how can we get ourselves in trouble with this, essentially? Um, because typically we would know exactly how you know, a given ordinance would work. And I'm going back and looking at the 13 approaches, um, for example, um, pursue widening of roads. Like, pursue to me means try, it doesn't mean do it. But I just want to understand from a legal perspective, both what the expectation is and from a legal perspective, what we would be pre-committing to do because that's the next step. Um, I'm not opposed to most of these proposals. I'm trying to work through where, where I'm informed enough to say, yeah, we can do that. And I, 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 given the late breaking time at which we saw these, especially the new seven, I'm having difficulty with that. Um, so enhance construction methods and materials to be non-combustible. Um, you know, in principle sounds good, but what happens if we think we've complied? What is the ramification of putting this in a legal ramification of putting it in a resolution without the level of specificity we would normally have? So that is a, is a very good point. And so uh, we did spend considerable amount of time on the language. And I think that both the fire district's attorney and um, myself are comfortable that what this is is a good faith effort. This anticipates a good faith effort on the part of the town council. It does not require the town council to adopt any of the seven measures or the, the 13 um, measures. Um, and the council legally cannot to look to them without yes, um, and so we we both wanted to um, uh, you know make sure that the count that the language was <clears throat> enforceable in that it was not a pre commitment which would be invalid, and so 
um, the council has a good faith requirement, I believe, under this provision to at least consider, discuss, analyze, and address those measures. But okay. ultimately, the discussion is with the council as to whether the mm -hmm. actual action should be adopted. And the reason I asked with the tonight memo, um, you know, adoption and codification by ordinance. Um, there's also reference to changing our general plan. And, you know, today, I don't know if the general plan is legally the right place to put something or an ordinance or the safety element versus the housing element. So that's why I'm exploring this, a good faith commitment to, to address it, um, meaning I'm not adopting this particular language tonight, but in the future, we're having a good faith commitment to discuss it makes me more comfortable. Is there a way where we can make that clearer in the rear end, Bob? I mean, we can discuss that later. Maybe that's a discussion point. Okay. Um, and then the language on the MMRP adoption um, of what was in our um, memo last time, college memo, of calling the additional items to be added that are not mitigation, but climate policies versus um, enhancements versus anything else. Um, I appreciate more of a legal view on those language differences. Um, I think we were talking about enhancements, guidances, et cetera. Um, maybe you can comment on what, what the legal implications of those different approaches and phrasing are. Sure. So the, um, the intent of the additional enhancements as I understand them from the planning commission colleagues memo and then carried forward to the council um, colleagues memo was that the, the recommendations were specifically and expressly not intended to be mitigation measures. And so the so it is a little from a legal perspective, it's a little awkward for that reason to put these measures into a mitigation and monitoring report because typically you only see mitigation measures in a um, MMRP. Um, and so to um, However, I, I think that that the desire that I heard from both the planning commission and the, and the town council discussion was that we wanted to create a, an enforceable mechanism to implement these measures, and the MMRP was um, that mechanism that made sense to the majority of, of the town council and, and the planning commission. So, with that. Um, I would caution as a legal matter that, that what we need to do is just distinguish that these um, enhancements are not mitigation measures and that would be the, the language that we would suggest. And so I think it was something like um, other policies, if you wanted, you know, and then parentheses, not mitigation measures was the suggestion. If you wanted to call them other, um, you know, uh, enhancements and policies, you know, that would be fine. That the intent is just to clarify that they are not mitigation measures. Okay, thank you. And the last question is more in terms of our planning. I mean, obviously people are looking at the, and have different reactions to the state mandate. Um, and there are questions about tracking the ability to challenge the state mandates, the ability to explain uh, why we have safety issues that are special to us. But whatever that discussion leads to from a legal perspective, what happens if someone's successful outside of the town and the arena numbers are reduced by a third? What, what is it that that means for us? And is it feasible to put in some reference to future changes 
that happen under the law and what that means for our element. Do we need to? Is it a good, bad, or indifferent idea? I'd, I'd like to hear you talk about that. Yes. So a um, number of years ago, it was um, very popular to do that. Um, and there was there were a lot of cities that went on the record as um, objecting to the whole RENA process, et cetera. And they loaded up their resolutions with language to that effect. Um, it doesn't have any legal impact, frankly. It was more of kind of, you know, a, a political statement that these cities were making. And it tended to um, uh, provide a red flag for HD, HCD reviewers. It was just an indication that the town was not taking its obligations seriously. So the best practice these days is, is not to include that language. You can certainly make statements on the record about that, but because it doesn't um, result in any uh, legal benefits, I would not suggest it. Certainly if, if the courts um, do find that the arena numbers are overinflated and there's a successful challenge and, and you know, numbers are reduced, then the town would absolutely have the legal authority to um, adopt, readopt its housing element with reduced numbers. And you wouldn't have to have this protective language and resolution. So there's future recourse if something happens as some people out there are trying to see what makes sense at the time such an event happens. Exactly. Without enhancing our own documents. Right. Okay, thank you. I, follow, I mean, does that mean we'd have to go back to HCD and get a new plan approved? Yes, yes. But, you know, they all, all it would involve is a reduction of, of the number of housing. Well, yeah, obviously it depends on how, what we did, like in terms of Ford Field and some, I mean, Ford Park um, and other things. So, I mean, I could imagine it may be a little bit more than just take a site off, but yeah. Right. Um, staying on the whereas comment, sorry, staying on the whereas comment, um, in terms of process, should we be discuss? like, I guess the question is, is there a date that uh, staff has in mind based on, in, in terms of uh, the date for the safety element completion, based on where you are in the process now and what's anticipated? Or is that more of a discussion item? I think it's probably more of a discussion item. Okay. All right. Um, another question I had related to dates is in your presentation, Laura, you mentioned um, there was a question about extending the sunrise date further. Um, it sounded like you were not um, necessarily supportive of that. I was curious the amount by which it's been, I know we've pushed back to January, 2025 to kind of do the very, very, very beginnings and not have an RFP until like nine months later, but what date has been suggested in terms of pushing that back further? Um, no date has been suggested to me, but okay. I've been asked okay. whether we can change that date more. Okay. And so that's why I'm just offering that if you wanted to change it by like three months or so, for example, I don't think that would be a problem, but I wouldn't recommend changing it by a whole nother year, right. for example, because then we'd be you. running out of time. Right. So I was just thinking like as a, for instance, you know, because we're in March right now, if we wanted to say, you know, April one and maybe keeping the RFP the same, or I don't know if the RFP would also, just so we have a full 10, a full two years, 24 months, if, you know, it's not a huge amount, but given how long these processes take, um, every amount helps. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, I don't wanna get into discussion there. Um, I was curious, maybe this is more uh, for Cara in terms of, are there any other updates um, that you'd wanna share from other communities in terms of builder's remedy or lawsuits, especially just because, you know, I know different members of the public are coming up to speed on um, all of this at different times. So just, Thought it would be for myself. I'd I'd be interested to know, but as well as for the public. 
Yes. Um, so mm -hmm. there are um, some peninsula cities that have received uh, several builders remedy projects. Um, up to my head, I believe it's Los Altos Hills, um, Palo Alto, uh, you. Can you think of any others where? I think there's one on the Upper Peninsula. It might be Pacifica. Um, so certainly, um, uh, you know, they're starting to to be filed. Um, in terms of what was the other? lawsuits, lawsuits. The yes. Yes. lawsuits. So um, there have been thirteen lawsuits filed by Yimby groups um, against. Um, uh, peninsula cities that have not, that did not adopt their housing element by January 31st. Um, in talking to the Yimby groups, we understand that there will likely be a, a second round of lawsuits that will come possibly in connection with this upcoming March 31st date. Um, against additional cities that are dragging their heels in terms of not adopting. Um, and But we don't know when exactly those, those lawsuits will come. Um, and again, as we mentioned, we don't think we would be in that, in that second targeted group because we are taking affirmative actions to um, work on our housing element. Um, there is one other lawsuit that was um, filed by um, Huntington Beach, um, and that was against HCB and the state, um, and it uh, it was a a um, dispute of the Rena numbers for Southern California. Even though the Southern California numbers have been um, adjudicated for a while now, um, but Huntington Beach did file a, a lawsuit in federal court. And um, there was a recent trial court decision at the district court level striking down um, Huntington Beach's um, constitutional claims against Rena. So that lawsuit is, is winding its way um, through the process. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm bouncing around here a little bit. My next question is kind of piggybacking on Craig's line of questioning on SB9. I thought what I have heard a couple times now is that we cannot put SB9, well, it's it's not recommended to put SB9 in our site's inventory because we don't have the documented history. Um, and so I think I got a little confused by his last line of questioning. I, I understand that we can have it happen that we, if and when we do get SB9 applications, at, if, if and when they come in, we can apply them towards our inventory our, applies them towards our arena, but in terms of putting them on the upfront for our inventory, it's still advised not to do that for that reason. Correct. Correct. So I understand. So I understood some nuance um, in Council Member Taylor's question. Okay. And so I agree with you. It is not advised to put them in our site inventory as a projection of SB nine units. But I understood the previous question to be. If SB9 units come in, could we reduce the number of units that are in the opt-in program? And that's the part that I think could be possible and worthy of discussion later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you, Laura. Let's see. I was wondering, I'm unclear on where Woodside is in their process and was wondering how have they been working on the key approaches as well and how our two communities might be working on this together? Um, that's a great question and I don't know the answer to it. Um, I don't know if, Cara, if you've had recent conversations. Yes, I, I did talk to um, Woodside Fire's um, attorney about that. And they um, were not aware that, that Woodside that Woodside Fire, I'm sorry, that the town of Woodside and that the county had not yet adopted their housing elements. Um, and I told them that they were still in the process of adopting their housing elements. 
um, they, you know, the, the attorney mentioned that they will probably talk to those two agencies about those issues as well. Okay. It makes sense to have a uniform approach. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my main question is just looking at these, looking at these mitigation requests that came in this afternoon. Um, I mean, a lot of these are things, several of these cite sort of other existing laws. So, I mean, um, one, you know, the first one it cites government code 51179 and the new uh, buoy ordinance from, from the fire district. Um, you know, two things. I mean, several of these things look like they're just asking us to kind of comply with, with laws that are already in the books. And the other part is, what if this is covered by the fire code? And I, I mean, we're waiting for a fire code from the district, correct? Um, yes, we are waiting for um, fire code from the district um, for consideration and ratification by the town council. Um, I would have to think a little bit, um, but I could, you know, read it a little bit and try to answer that question in a few moments. But um, I think the main thing that would be included in a proposed fire code would be related to building setback and building separation. Um, the Cal Fire minimum fire safe regulations are a separate thing. Um, and and last I heard they were dropped. Is that ever um, I believe they're about to go into effect. So they've been in draft. Yeah, I think they um, go into effect April 1st. Okay, thank you. So some of these things are about um, how how do we enact the fire safe regulations, for example, so, right? So number three is about um, using the Moritz map to implement the fire safe regulations. So it's about what map would we reference when implementing that. So that's that's an example. Or any successor map. I read this to say that if the district adopts either the flame mappers or the, the Imminent Cal Fire revisions that that would that that's the successor map that's referred to here. So we'd be agreeing to basically say that the ideal map is the next fire map, not more snap or the 2008 map. Yeah. So I, this this language definitely um, emphasizes the successor map. Um, I was in a webinar. I've lost track of days, but maybe in the last two days or so, um, related uh, with the Cal Fire chiefs, um, a Cal Cities um, webinar, and they still will not give a date of when the um, Cal Fire maps are going to come out. Um, but they did say that they're gonna give us a 60 day warning before they come out. Then we have time to review them and then, then they'll take our comments and then we'll have a window to adopt a map after that. So we have not received notification <laughs> that it's coming within 60 days and they acknowledge that they haven't even run the model for the cities yet. So they have only run the state responsibility areas. They haven't even run the model for the local responsibility areas. So they said it would still be this summer, but when I count 60 days, I don't know how they say it's still gonna be this summer um, to get CAL FIRE maps. And does, does using the Moritz map to assess sites, I, I don't recall it having any significant effect on the sites you were chosen in the inventory. Is that remembering that correctly? I, I felt like they weren't, did it have a profound impact on, on our inventory or no? Well, it, it depends on perspective. I mean, the Moritz map was part of the consideration um, of the adoption of sites. And we do have in the housing element, the housing element sites mapped. Um, and in a table, but there are definitely sites that fall into the high category on the Moritz map. Mm -hmm. um, and I could pull that out if you wanted to get into the details of that, but it, it, it does have some bearing that would be worth the council's consideration. But it's vegetation, so it could be mitigated. That could be removed. So in fact, that'll probably be the first mitigation. Measure. Right? Yeah, and then they would be any project would be subject to um, vegetation management requirements, um, the existing ones and any that may be adopted in the future. Thank you. I think that's all of my questions. Any other council questions before we move on? Um, I had two. Um, do we know what other jurisdictions have done in terms of an ISMD or EIR, like where is Woodside if it submitted its plan? Has it also completed an ISMD or EIR? It's been a 
a little while since I've checked in um, with other communities. Um, to my knowledge, uh, Woodside is doing an EIR. Um, that's why their housing element was delayed so that they could do an EIR. Um, there are a handful of communities in the immediate area that have done an ISMND. There were several communities who were already doing large general plan amendments and had already done an EIR that covers their housing element. So they were just doing statements that they're consistent with those. Um, and then there's one or two places that took a very different approach that we would not recommend um, that were more related to doing exemptions um, for their environmental review. So Woodside, for example, is doing an EIR. It sounds like it's in process and not done. That's my understanding. And yet we're viewing ourselves as needing to have the document done when we're adopting the housing element. Um, I just want to understand the discrepancy between those two approaches. Legally, you have to adopt the environmental document before adopting the housing element. So um, they are, everyone is supposed to use the same procedure. Okay. So there's a little bit of a question on how that's going to work out. I understand they're delaying adoption of their housing element until their EIR is done. Thank you. Um, and in terms of self-certification, which I understand why we want to do that, um, but I mean, since I'm not a CEQA expert and we're also being asked to certify that the ISMND is sufficient, you know, from a legal standpoint, Car, do you have any legal questions on the sufficiency? I mean, I, I don't know what to do with a town council member who doesn't have that background in order to get myself to a place where I can meaningfully self-certify. Sure. So when you adopt the housing element, you are essentially self-certifying. By adopting the resolution approving the housing element, you are stating that you believe that the housing element complies with all of the technical statutory requirements of housing element law. And so, um, you know, I think that a self-certification in a way is, is very similar to just adopting the resolution, adopting the housing element. Um, okay. okay, but from a as council to the town, you're comfortable that there's no major issue there for us to be aware of as we're thinking that through. Yes, as, as Laura mentioned in, in her presentation, the process for self-certification um, is a little ambiguous in the housing element law. And mm -hmm. typically the, the self-certification um, remedy comes up when HCD has made the final ruling that your housing element is not in compliance or has just not complied with the time frame for reviewing. And so there is a, a remedy in housing element law where that in that case, uh, towns can self-certify. This case that we're in right now is, is not, does not square completely with that statutory scheme. Thank you. And I would just add to that, if you've seen media coverage or kind of heard about pushback against self-certification, that was generally regarding the cities that had not even submitted to HCD yet, but were self-certifying. So since we've submitted to HCD and received comments and talked to them about the comments, we have much more confidence in self-certifying. Other council questions? Okay, uh, we're coming up on two hours. Before we go to public comment, I'm gonna call just a five or 10 minute break. Start again at let's say uh, eight fifty. We will start again with public comment. Mm -hmm. On Zoom, nice. Sorry, um, we're back in session. Um, I will. Uh, I'll. I'll repeat my comment for the record. Uh, we will take public comment on everything: uh, the full housing element and ISMND. 
We will then uh, recuse two members of the council with conflict so that we can have a specific discussion of the three properties on Alpine Road, and then they will come back for a full discussion. I currently see seven hands up in Zoom. I presume there will be hands up here in the room. I noticed that Fire Marshal Bullard's hand is up. I'm going to invite him to speak initially. Um, he perhaps wants to clarify some of his, his, his recent communication. Don, go ahead. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Don Bullard, Fire Marshal for the Woodside Fire Protection District. First off, I want to apologize for the late notification to town staff and to town council as there were extenuating circumstances and challenges beyond my control that I was faced with that I tried to explain and make very clear to Director Russell and so I do apologize for the late notification. As you may or may not be aware, I have been working closely with town staff and the town council to ensure that along with the adoption of the housing element, fire concerns are fully, let me repeat this, fully addressed. To be clear, as a single purpose district, Woodside Fire Protection District does not take any view with respect to the housing element itself or its contents. We do, however, take a very, very strong view that we need to take fire prevention seriously. With that in mind, I presented a list of fire prevention measures that I believe must be included in the safety element and enacted into law. Let me repeat that must be included in the safety element and enacted into law so that we can guarantee that these measures will be enforceable. I presented those actions to the town's planning commission on February 15th, 2023, as well as via email to the town council for this evening's meeting and the fire district's council and Danforth also presented to town legal council. I am very pleased that the town has incorporated its commitment to work with the district to adopt these or other measures expeditiously. The fire district appreciates that commitment and takes it very seriously. We hope that the town takes the commitment to adopt these measures expeditiously as seriously as the district and will instruct staff to move forward with these actions immediately. Thank you for allowing the fire marshal to speak at your town council meeting this evening. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Mr. Thank Mayor, could I just ask one clarification? Oh, sure. Don, I, I just wanted to clarify, you said to um, enact these in the safety element, and we're talking about the housing element tonight. So I just wanna make sure that I understand that what we've proposed is to, after the housing element, work to make sure that all these other things get into the safety element which does seem like where they belong, but I just want to make sure that we're clear on your intent. Well, I do want, you know, if we have to put them into the safety element, we can put them into the safety element, but ultimately they need to be going into the municipal code so that they can be enforceable. Got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Fire Marshal Bullard. Um, I'm going to start going through Zoom hands. Rita Combs is next. Rita, go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question, my comment, and hopefully um, uh, Marshall Bullard is still on the line. Uh, Council Member Hasco mentioned something about the Woodside Fire District last week, and the letter you mentioned tonight is most likely not the Woodside Fire District reference she made last week. The mayor said that this was going to be addressed. Uh, where has been, this been addressed? The note from the Woodside Fire District today is important, and these comments should be incorporated into the documents that are possibly being approved tonight, especially the ISMMD. Holding these changes to the future safety element does not correct what the ISMD currently states. Item number five, and it says, uh, it was determined that the project would have no impact or less than significant impact on the following environmental factors, aesthetics, agriculture, forestry resources, biological resources, energy, hydrology, water quality, land use, planning, mineral resources, parks, recreation, utilities, so on and so forth, and wildfire, mandatory findings of significance. Um, you know, I just want to say, 
does that make sense that these items should say no impact or less an impact, significant impact of our town? Uh, these medications need to be listed in the ISMD. Nowhere in the ISMMD does it mention how and how much the cost for all of this infrastructure that is not significant. Who's going to pay for this? The utilities, the sewage, the extra undergrounding, um, you know, increases with the schools. How are we, the residents, going to pay for these infrastructure issues if developers need not worry about these issues? Parcel tax, bonds, more pull of our limited re reserves? Will it cost each household $2,000? $20,000 or possibly more. And I just wanna mention that item number six, it talks about the, the administrative record is located in the office of the town clerk. We don't have a town clerk. It was impossible to get information today. And you know, one of the speakers in oral statements asked that question, it was not answered. And here we are supposed to get information and we're sending a document saying that, oh, if people wanna get that information, they can reach out to the town clerk who's acting as the town clerk. And in slide program 3-1, it states Dorothy Ford Field. Still, um, that was presented tonight. Does that mean that the field itself will be dismantled? Would we, the residents, have to pay back the loan associated with the creation of the Dorothy Ford Field, the baseball diamond and everything, that the loan that we took out I, I still see the document that Howard filled out years ago. There are certain restrictions on that property associated with the town's loan. How much is that going to cost us and what restrictions will it also impact onto the residents? You know, I, I ask these questions in, in good faith and I, I hope that the questions that the residents are asking are written down and not just, you know, cherry picked on how and which ones get answered. You know, perhaps we need a different process moving in the future for our questions, but you know, our questions are real and they need to be answered and addressed somehow. You know, I, I just hope that these things are added in and our cost is considered. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Uh, I have a speaker card here from Karen Askey. Karen, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, bet you you can hear me just fine. Um, well, it's been great to be here and to actually have so many people here and being engaged. I really like it, so thank you. Um, these recent storms have taught us just how devastating Mother Nature can be in our community. Flooding, landslides, power outages, falling trees, all threatening our safety. And fire season will soon be here. Please let us use this learning as we move forward. There has been a lot of good hard work and many, many, many hours dedicated to our state mandated housing element. Thank you to Laura and staff, the town council, the planning commission, and all the volunteers that have been involved in this. It's no easy task. And when one is given all that blood, sweat, and tears, it is painful to think that it still may fall short of an ideal plan. What I would like the town council to agree on is that after we submit this round of the housing element, we also plan on submitting revisions that will improve the plan, aligning it more with the community culture and ethos of our general plan. Let's plan on revising the plan and view it as an iterative process. And let's rezone only when we absolutely must. For example, as we receive more SB9 applications, we can replace the opt-in program with SB9 units and not deal with the uncertainty of what issues may arise with the opt-in program. We don't know what we don't know. Look at what happened at 4370 Alpine Road where folks visualized residential units on top of commercial space, but the owner came back with a completely different plan and threw us for a loop. If we end up on pace to surpass our ADU or JADU target, let's decrease those units elsewhere. 
I can't imagine that units under 500 square feet, those are JADUs or conversions of existing structures such as I have, would not be considered low income housing. We must not overbuild. You've probably heard about the new proposal from YIMBY and the Nature Conservancy to stop urban sprawl due to the safety of Lewy communities and wildfire risk. Proposed legislation from unlikely partners that makes sense. Let's leverage proposals such as these and push back a bit on the state. Is it prudent to construct most of the new homes along our major evacuation route? With the affordable housing building laws, it appears that our town could lose that 75 foot setback that is essential to our safety. Will we be creating a dangerous choke point? Is it prudent to eliminate small businesses that provide work to lower income employees such as Glen Oaks? It's Stanford owned land. I believe it's deed restricted, deed restricted and we should probably take a second look at that. Is it prudent to not believe that a 20% increase in population would be insignificant to our infrastructure and public services? One example already, we have constant parking congestion at the Alpine Inn and Windy Hill, and at given times at Ford Field, Alpine Hills, and Town Center. These new developments will only make things more challenging. So what is prudent? Putting the safety of our residents comes first at the top of my list. Being Karen, willing to put up. more work in to improve the future of Portola Valley joins in as well. Let's take the time to get things right and continue to make improvements to the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next hand up on Zoom is Mark. Martin, Martin, go ahead. Hello. Am I heard? Yes, we hear you. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my comment. Dr. Martin Miller, uh, uh, 3350 Alpine Road. Um, I've been here for 22 years now. I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident, having been born in Burlingame, 1961, moved to Portola Valley, 1972. So I've studied the geography, the weather patterns, um, and the physics, the geology for decades. Uh, I tuned in about 7.15 p.m. hearing Ms. Russell talk about the feasibility of development of the Dorothy Ford open space, which I'd like to comment on predominantly. Um, I went through a major remodel of my home here my property looks directly down on that site and directly across the street, Alpine Road. And uh, this entire section of the uh, East West Ridge is an active mud shallows on the Stanford geologic map. I had to go through extensive soil testings with um, Murray geotechnical engineers in order to get my basically just rebuilding on the same footprint past. It is not geotechnically feasible or economical to build anything on the Dorothy Ford open space. There are two 400 plus year oak trees that would have to be removed. Somebody has put orange ribbons around them, uh, approximately a month ago. The roots of those trees are what holds that land. As most of us know, a young man, Jose Vasquez, lost his life just shy of the on-ramp to 280 South from a falling eucalyptus tree eight days ago because of the torrents of Los Trancos Creek becoming a river, which it does seasonally. In order to build anything there, those oak trees would have to be removed. There is no precedent for removing such heritage trees. In Portola Valley, there's a longstanding precedent that any tree, oak tree, that has, I believe, more than a 24 inch diameter trunk has to be 
replanted with at least three other trees. I'm not exactly sure. Um, there's no precedent for removing trees that have six foot diameter trunks and those trees hold that land together. So I'd like to point out, it's just not economically feasible to even consider building anything there within 15, 20, 50 feet of, of, of Los Chancos Creek, which seasonally becomes a river. Martin, I have to ask you to wrap up your overtime. Uh, okay. Um, so I'm also aware that the majority of that land was donated by the Ford family and some portion, I believe historically was owned by Ryland Kelly, who uh, was one of the original developers of Ladera and own the narrow strip on the other side of the creek. I'd like to propose that maybe some of the residents uh, adopt a fund to buy whatever the town's interest is, and we can effectually stop this nonsensical debate about oh, man, developing you, anything there. Thank you. Our next hand up is from Eckstein. I believe that's Craig Eckstein. Craig, go ahead. So, uh, one thing I want to, uh, to mention is that. Craig, we're having trouble hearing you. Uh, okay, well, hold on one sec. Uh, um, can you come back to me? Let me try and figure this out. Sure. Sure. Okay. okay. Right. Next hand up is Dale Fowl. Dale, go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, letting me speak this evening. A uh, couple of things. First, a clarification. I want to make sure that you're all aware that the Moritz map is far more than just a vegetation map. It takes into account aspect, uh, orientation, uh, chimney effects, and other things, in, and in far greater resolution than, than CAL FIRE uh, will ever be able to do. If you have any questions, I recommend you all listen to the Planning Commission meeting uh, from uh, just earlier this month, or go all the way back to the uh, Wildfire Preparedness Committee where Ray Morris gave a presentation about a year ago to learn about that. Uh, primarily, I want to comment on the ISMND tonight, and the fact that you've been hearing me harp for several years now about the safety element, and I think you've made a great plan here. I applaud all of you for all the hard work to get the housing element together, but essentially you built a house with no foundation, and that foundation is the safety element, and we must consider safety above all else. And as a matter of fact, the draft safety element was awful. It was just a horrible, horrible document as, as you see from just the requirements that the fire marshal has asked to be put into the safety element. And that's the basis for the ISMND. Uh, it boggles my mind that anyone could actually sign a document that says there's a less than significant impact by adding 20% more buildings in town, 20% more people to our evacuation plans. Uh, that's putting more, more uh, fuel load on, the, on uh, our, our area, and it's adding a lot more people uh, to our potential choke points, which again, we saw earlier this week. So uh, we saw almost a year ago now, over a year ago, that the town council actually approved the county hazard uh, document which we all know was wrong. I please request this council, do not put your name on something that you know is wrong, something that the ISMND is saying that there's a less than significant impact uh, to our safety because of fire and evacuation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go back. Um, let's try Craig Eckstein again. Craig? Can through the mayor, is there any chance we could turn the volume of the speaker down a little bit? I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like our residents are yelling at us and I don't think that's their intent. Yeah, so yeah. Howard, do you have a little bit of control here? Yeah, thank you. I mean, if, if the people in the audience need the volume, I'm happy to have it up, but man, standing here, it's pretty loud. Hard to speak with that, yeah, tell us if you're having trouble hearing. Tell us. All right, how's this now? 
That sounds much better, Craig. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, few points. Uh, just want to first mention that. Wait, Craig. Sorry, yeah. we just lost you again. I. Uh, a few points. Um, just want to mention first. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that I found it. Yesterday. Craig, sorry, you're still. You're. I don't know what's happening, but you're still break. You're breaking up. You sound clear for a second, then you break up again. I don't know. If um, the mic or something. I'm. I'm right in front of my computer. Can you hear me now? I better. No. No. Um, all right, back to me. I'll try. I'll try logging in on something else. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Are you still there? I, I I am. Can you hear me? You sound really good right now. Okay. So uh, first off, I just want to say for such an important matter, uh, matter, I'm surprised we have yet to have anything sent to us by the town surveying the public about how we feel about everything. Uh, that still feels like uh, we're kind of cut out of the process to some degree. Public comment isn't enough. I think you, you should know what the the town over you know overall feels in terms of uh, development and how we approach it. I, I do like the idea of dispersing development where people want to do it. But the high density ideas, I think, are a non-starter, especially with like the Ford Field idea. We believe that that goes against shits of the people who donated that land. So you want damage and credibility. Craig, we've lost you again. All right. Can I, can I write these up? Hello? Craig, we... Oh. Yeah. Can I write these up? I can't hear you again. Sorry. All right. Uh, come back to me, I guess. Oh, uh, okay. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on. Ron Eastman, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your list, taking my comments. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as, as, as Dale Fow just explained, you know, fire science involves more than just um, looking at where the vegetation's at. And um, that's, you know, it, 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 and, and, and the map that Ray Moritz the fire ecologist produced uh, looked at a number of factors. Um, there was a comment made earlier about vegetation. Um, yeah, you can remove the vegetation. You can get maybe somebody to to cut the weeds one year, but you can't change the topology of the town. And I one thing I've not heard is a discussion on how we're going to enforce vegetation management because you know in, enforcement's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to be a very involved thing and it's going to be a very unpleasant thing if we're going to rely entirely upon vegetation management year after year to mitigate the fire hazards we face and, and, and uh, 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 particularly you know as, as as the ground gets drier and drier it's not going to work so the Moritz map was based upon a picture of the town after a hundred years of fire, a uh, 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 retardation or mitigation. You know, it, it's it's the hazards that exist did in two thousand eight are going to be the hazards that exist twenty years from now. Except, I expect they're going to be worse. And if we add twenty percent more people. To the town is going to be even that much worse. So I I, I wish to encourage you to adopt the Ritz map, as as um, as Don Bullard has suggested. And um, and um, anyway, that's <laughs> I had lots written. I I've, I've written lots of other comments, but uh, uh, other other people have have. have um, They've already said them, uh, so I won't take any more of your time. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Ron. Um, is there anyone in the in the schoolhouse that wants to comment? 
Bob Turcott, go ahead. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure why we're still discussing Mertz versus Cal Fire. Um, it's very clear um, why the Mertz map is superior. Jeff Alves, Sarah Warnikoff, Cora Silver, Jeremy Dennis all heard Mertz's presentation Hello. a year ago. Hello to you. Fire Preparedness Committee. I don't want to go out there. It's too rainy. Uh, Ron, you're still on. Can you mute yourself? Oh, sorry. No, no worries. <laughs> That's why the Mertz map was adopted. That's why our fire safety policies have been based on it since 2010. Why are we still discussing this? Why are we still calling it a vegetation map? I encourage people to watch the uh, Ray Mertz give his presentation. As I said, members of the staff and town council uh, are well aware of the quality of that map. Um, the ISMMD documents that there are, are no significant impact on wildfire safety. It documents that there is no need for mitigation. I applaud the work of Nicholas Targ, Linda Brothers, um, the subcommittee on the town council to develop a framework to allow uh, mitigations to be developed and implemented. But my question is, what developer, what YIMB law group would embrace those when the CEQA document that we have required by state law to identify significant impacts, uh, documents that there are no, documents that no mitigations are needed. My second point is, or third point, um, in your role on the town council, often discretion and judgment are needed and are important. I don't see a role for discretion and judgment in your evaluation of the ISMMD. It states that there are no significant impacts with respect to wildfire safety, and yet our draft safety element eliminates existing safety policies from 34 to 83% of Portola Valley's area. How is that not, how does that not impose a significant impact on the safety of residents? You're required by state law to, um, uh, the ISMD is required by state law to identify significant impact. You can't approve it as a facility. Finally, um, I'd like to ask Jeff Ellis and Sarah Warnikoff as the uh, subcommittee for the um, housing element, as a mayor and vice mayor, why is it that after a year of, sub of ad hoc housing element committee work, after the last public review by the Planning Commission of Town Council, why, why was the um, CAL FIRE map added to the housing element in place of the MRITS map? Why is it that the fire safety policies are now based in the draft safety element on the CAL FIRE map, um, erasing them from wide swaths of Portola Valley? That wasn't staff's decision. Mm -hmm. That was Town Council's decision, as, as you, Jeff, pointed out on December 7th. So in the discussion, I would like to hear um, how, how those changes benefit the residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next hand up from um, uh, Zoom is Nan Shostek. Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay, great. Am I booming? Has my voice booming? Booming <laughs> enough. Okay, thanks. All right, I'd like to make, um, actually, th it's going to be two, three points. Um, first, I encourage you to implement the uh, fire district's recommendations as mitigations in the ISMND itself. This way you'll have the full force of CEQA behind you for enforcement. It's fine also to include them in the safety element, but the safety element itself has no means of enforcement. These need to be mitigations in the ISMND. I've been working closely with parts of the draft safety element. It's constructed mainly of recommendations and aspirational suggestions. Uh, and some parts are a little bit more detailed. It has no teeth unless it's implemented through our municipal code. Fire Marshal Bullard insists that the fire district's recommendations be implemented by law. That's essential, but it's not enough. Our municipal code itself doesn't have the power that CEQA will against aggressive developers. Please, please put the fire district's recommendation in both the ISMND and the safety element. 
Second point, I'd like to emphasize one point Rita made a few minutes ago. As a resident and taxpayer, I ask you, council members, to initiate a cost study for all the costs associated with implementing the housing element, not just the cost of consultants for the post implementation plan. As soon as possible, we residents need and deserve an estimate of costs and the options for paying for them. It can be fairly quick and dirty, but let's understand the true cost of adding more than 250 housing units and increasing the town's population by 20%. One final thought. It should be feasible to collect donations to save Dorothy Ford open space and field from development. More than any other site, this place is iconic to the town. We should try again and again and again if necessary to find and fund an alternative site. Please don't give up and feed the Dorothy Ford site to the development meat grinder. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next hand from Zoom is Jean Chaput. Jean, go ahead. All right, guys, unmute it. Yeah, and first of all, I want to apologize if I lose this transmission. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I want to apologize if I lose the transmission. My internet's been probably out 50% of this meeting, and it has been out January, February, March. So uh, it's the Conestoga wagon technology from AT&T. I apologize. I want to thank everybody for all their hard work. Uh, not necessarily agree with everybody, but <clears throat> first of all, I, I have three points. I want to support Dr. Turcott's uh, comments, recommendations. That's first. I have a question. What is the status of uh, our charter city considerations? And uh, so I would like somebody to comment on that. And I have asked probably every meeting I've attended via Zoom, uh, why our town council <clears throat> representatives are not interested in at least investigating the legal challenges to the, uh, to the hand puppets up in Sacramento who are dictating all of this to us. And there are significant legal challenges in the works. And uh, I'll give you a quick analogy, at least from my perspective. It's a football game. So you've got two teams, you've got coaches, you've got managers, you've got medical attendants, and then you've got the fans. And at this point, it seems like the two teams on the field, one is fielding 11 players, one is fielding one player. The one player team is the team full of uh, the cities and communities that are trying to challenge the state legally. Uh, what they need are 11 players to participate. On the sidelines of the coaches, who are basically people wondering if it's a good idea to challenge the state. And then in the stands are the fans, and that's PV. We're hoping for the best. And I leave you with those comments. Thank you, Gene. <clears throat> Craig Eckstein is in the building. Um, I'll let you finish your comments. So only has Sorry about the technical problems, but I live close by, so. Uh, Craig, I'm gonna give you two minutes because we did hear the first part of your comments. Uh, okay. so. Just to highlight, uh, I wish we had been polled at some point about what, you know, the town feels because, you know, I believe the majority of the town is against big development. Um, I want to say that, you know, you talk about all these extra costs that we're going to incur. Well, <clears throat> you know, I'd rather see that money spent towards, like Gene was just saying, fighting this. I find this being an unreasonable uh, requirement that the state is putting upon all the cities is obviously large pushback across the state from a lot of different communities. And it seems like fear of retribution is the only reason why, you know, uh, repercussions is why you guys do not want to push back. But yet we're in a state that pushes back all the time against the federal government, you know, with sanctuary cities and sanctuary state. That's, you know, something they've been doing without any large repercussions, why don't we push back against the state? I do think you're going against the goodwill of, of the person who donated Fort Field. I'm sure they would be horrified to find out all of a sudden you're gonna throw in you know, a large development there, take down trees that 
probably were very dear to them, but also dear to our community. I mean, this is something my kids have played at Ford Field. I played at Ford Field. I grew up here. To see that redevelop, even if the field stays, the whole ambiance of that place would be changed forever. And, and then just to bring up a, a recent development, we lost a person, tragedy that that tree fell on that, that gentleman who was you know, in town to work. It only takes one tree to shut down Alpine Road. If that was during a fire, there'd be hundreds of cars lined up trying to get out and they would have nowhere to go. That happened one, and then a second tree fell. This could happen at any time, unless you're gonna clear and make a huge, you know, clear space, like hundreds of feet back from either side of the road, you always have that issue. So to add more people, add this to the, you know, 20% of population, not only the cost, but just the safety issue in that we have not had that part of it fully analyzed. It feels like we're pushing this housing development before we know all the facts. And you never go make a long-term decision that's irreversible without knowing what you're dealing with first. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Craig. Okay, uh, I see uh, Martin has already commented. So Leslie Kreese, I think. Good evening. Um, and thank you for getting the last name right. Um, first of all, I, I, I wanna say thank you to everybody sitting up there. I, I may not agree with everything that has been said and done, but I certainly respect all the hours that both the town council and the staff are putting in, so I, I thank you for that. Um, first of all, I, I would like to encourage you to take some of Nan's advice there, Ms. Shostak, and um, include the fire departments, the fire, um, Woodside Fire's recommendations in the ISMMD um, and not just holding it for the, the safety element. I believe we as a town will be stronger and safer if it is included in the ISMMD. And, and I thank Don Bullard too for making those comments today. Second, I am I am lost about how the cost for all of this gets paid for um, in terms of, of what, you know, what we would call infrastructure, right? Uh, sewage, roads, schools, more recreational facilities. There's gonna be more of us. We need more recreational facilities, um, electrical, et cetera. Um, I don't see a provision anywhere to make this something that developers have to help pay for, which means it's all on the backs of the residents. If this housing element is approved and a builder comes in and wants to build because you can't go back retroactively and say, oh, and by the way, we're expecting you to pay for X, Y, and Z. So I'd like to know how the town council thinks those things are going to get paid for. Um, and then, um, yeah, finally, I, I just, again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next hand up I see is Greg. Greg, go ahead. Oh, good, <clears throat> oh, good evening. Um, uh, I, 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 I want to, um, endorse the comments that have been made by most, almost all of the previous speakers about the amount of time and effort you people have put into this endeavor. Um, I've invested a considerable amount of time in it as well as, a, as, as an audience member. I think I probably only missed a couple of, of those 140 hours that, of public meetings. Um, look, I think probably the most prudent approach for our town council to take in this whole endeavor um, is to not do anything that is not reversible. And in particular, with respect to zoning, because as it's been explained to me, uh, reversing up zoning is going to be very difficult. So I think we have, in the middle of a highly controversial set of circumstances, the state affordable housing legislation, 
is clearly electorally unpopular. Um, the laws are untested. There's a growing uh, frequency of lawsuits being filed. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what will happen. I thought the suggestion that the Sunrise proposal deadline be postponed until after the next electoral cycle it was excellent because I suspect there's a high probability there will be some revisions uh, to this legislation and in particular in WUI communities. Um, I had a conversation this morning with a person at the town of Paradise who's regarded as their expert on a resilient fire protection and development and I would encourage our town council to you know, um, reach out to, to, to that community and, and other WUI communities that share the same kinds of issues that we are. But my message, I think, in the interest of all the citizens of Portola Valley and WUI communities is whatever we do with respect to submission of the housing element and any subsequent ordinances and, and building codes, that we not do anything that is not reversible. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Good. I don't see any hands up on Zoom. Anyone else in the room want to comment? Okay. Um, I see Nick, Nicholas Targ. Good. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to address the council. Uh, I'm Nicholas Carg, uh, I Fields Road. And uh, I just want to uh, identify a couple of clarifying points. Uh, I'm not advocating uh, or presenting a particular opinion, probably for the next opinion uh, from me already, and this is your decision. And the role that I play in the planning commission. But there was a question uh, with respect to the term gateway and where the term gateway came from. Gateway is a planning term of art, it's simply an entry point into a municipality. And one can have different views as to whether or not it is a loaded term, is a suggestive term. I'd also uh, identify that in the Alpine Scenic Corridor, uh, for those of us following falls and strikes, it's section 6203, which identifies the Alpine Scenic Corridor is particular importance as it serves as the gateway uh, from the more developed urban peninsula to the rural setting of the village. Not meant to be a loaded term, but it has reference back to the general plan and also this is Back to the Moritz map, uh, I understand how one could look at it as a uh, vegetation driven uh, map. It's incorrect, but I understand how one could draw that conclusion if one reads the report accompanying the Moritz map. It talks about veg and it doesn't talk about aspect uh, or slope in an obvious way. I think one can read it in, but subsequently through uh, the discussion and the statements uh, of Moritz, uh, he's made it clear uh, before the wildfire committee uh, that the Moritz map is based upon more than vegetation. And the impact of that, uh, of course, has to do with the ability to mitigate using veg management. It also goes to the question, not only whether uh, Title Seven a is applicable, because of course it is applicable to the town generally, but also there are additional requirements and uh, the uh, Marshall discussed this previously. Uh, finally, I've got two uh, last points. With respect to uh, the sunrise, uh, I wanna bring your attention to Eradicate Seven, or agenda page 93, 
uh, the uh, identification is that the town will proceed with the development uh, uh, of the site as outlined in program 2-1, unless another confirmed feasible site or program can achieve the same number of affordable uh, units uh, within the um, uh, planning period. That was a point we actually discussed uh, in the planning commission. And we discussed whether we should identify the number of units or whether the, uh, whether the- Nicholas, I do have to ask you to wrap up soon. Or whether the, uh, thank you. Or whether the housing element as a whole uh, is achieving the unit requirements as the numbers may change or we may end up generating more units from another location. And with that, uh, I have nothing further. During your deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Rusty Day, go ahead. Thank you very much, Rusty Day, 1718 Drive. And again, as I said last week, thank you very much for the really hard work and the good work you're doing on this. As I sat here tonight, I listened to two very different perspectives, one presented by the staff, one presented by the fire marshal. I want to draw your attention to the difference between what they said and how are you going to resolve their differences. Staff said they don't want anything done that would bind the town to implement these commitments. And that's why they don't want them categorized as mitigations because under CEQA, that would bind the town to implement these. And staff said they wanna make sure that you adopt into the resolution vague and ephemeral negotiating points, like widen the streets. I heard the fire marshal say, it is very, very important and he absolutely wants these to be implemented mandatory to address the significant impacts that this is going to have on wildfire hazard and risk in our town that you all know is true. He wants them implemented and he wants a binding commitment to implement them. The Moritz map has been in the general plan for 12 years, it's never been adopted. It's time to get going. Cal Fire's regulations went into effect July 1st, 19, 2021, not next April. It's time to implement them. Let's get going. So the question for you is how are we going to make that commitment? How do we make a binding commitment? And the answer is what Nan Shostak and Leslie Kreese told you. You only do it by amending the ISMMD, setting out the findings of significant impact and listing the fire marshal's request as mitigation. Notice he doesn't want some vague promise of widening the streets and thinking about how to expand defensible space. He gave you an explicit list of seven items, very clear, readily implementable, could be written into the ISMMD tomorrow and adopted Friday. And you can submit your housing element Friday. As I read these seven items, that he's listed, they seem to me to be identical to the seven mitigations that he requested the town to implement in January, two and a half months ago. You've had two and a half months to work this out and get these implemented. This is not some late breaking development. This is not some surprise. This is not some afterthought. The question is, are you going to take this seriously and implement the fire district's requests so that they are binding commitments to the town? Or are you going to treat this as the town council did a year and a half ago, the hazard mitigation plan that Dale Fowl referenced? Oh yeah, we'll change it. Well, you know what? It's March, 2023 and we still haven't changed it. Are we gonna do this seriously or are we just gonna sweep it under the rug and move on? Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. More comments from the schoolhouse. Uh, Randy, go ahead. Whoever. <clears throat> Thank you for taking. 
my uh, my second comment here. Train to truth, the Route 60 Alpine. Sorry, can't remember the name. Um, I, I do um, also thank you for all of your time and service. I, I don't envy your position. Um, I think things have changed a lot since the culmination of the, the ad hoc committee. With the submission of other neighboring towns housing elements, I think there's some further work to do to understand our status and our options and the ramifications. And I ask that that be done with high degree of transparency. And one of the, the, the things I've seen just in the previous meeting in the last few days is that committee chairs of the Emergency Preparedness Committee and the Parks and Recreation Committee have stated clearly that the ISMD is wrong in making a claim of no significance with respect to safety aspects and with respect to our parks and recreation. So we, we have these important committees and they're so knowledgeable and they have to, they, they, if there's a disagreement with town staff or with consultants, that disagreement should happen in public and we should, we should understand those, those concerns. And I, I believe we should get this document right and not just the ISMD. I think we should get the housing on as well. Because if we truly don't intend to develop Ford Field, we need to take it out now. And I, you know, I understand that's 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 not that's not obvious. That's not a no-brainer. And the ramification of builder's remedy, which has been, you know, widely discussed, but it's highly uncertain. We now have more information on in terms of how many have been filed, uh, the status of various uh, various jurisdictions. So we can learn more. And I, I ask that, that we create more transparency and better process around vetting this. And that can be done quickly because I, you know, as much as we would all like to, to, to fight the state, I think we have to uh, comply with the letter of the law, but put our challenges in black and white and negotiate in good faith with the state towards where we really want to go. And I don't think it's these programs. Imagine the future of Portola Valley if we expand these two key programs. And by the way, this is only 62 units, 62. So that's a number that we have to figure out. And yes, one of them is challenging because it's deed restricted low income. And Stanford won't even deed restrict it. So we, we have to work harder on, on that, that aspect. And what does Portola Valley look like if we expand building on our parks and open spaces and expand letting neighbors selectively our zone. That's not the community we want. That's not why most of us are here. And so I, I propose that we not kick the can down the road and that we just deal with this and deal with it in good faith and quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Just start with your name, please. Good evening, I'm the new guy. I have Dave Evans, 159 Brookside. Um, my family moved into Portola Valley about three years ago. Um, I am, however, a lifelong Silicon Valley native. My family's been here since the gold rush. Um, in, in that, the perspective I've tried to take in watching all the procedures has been that of the longest possible view I've ever mustered, which is to say that the only constant is change, right? You know, the orchards that my grandparents moved on top of when they plowed trees under, including their houses about Saratoga, um, is now such a shade of even when I knew as a child. And I, I understand that these things happen, right? And so I'm loath to resist wholesale change. I am, however, concerned about the preponderance of worries about safety elements, about the public areas that are being turned in. Um, as we lose those grounds, we put too much under concrete. And so I think the only real question, the actual thing you have to consider tonight is to ratify or not. And what I have heard is that most people don't want to ratify. And I've also heard that the penalty for not ratifying doesn't seem that scary. And so my encouragement to you is to take the time that you have left, whatever that may be, not two days, but maybe longer, and do the best job. Because um, it's really nice to be here. I'd like to stay here for long. Thanks, John. Thank you. OK, I see some more hands on Zoom. Uh, Christy Corley, go ahead. 
Thank you. And thank you for your love for our town to spend the time to be on town council. It's the heavy lift. Um, we bought into this town because we love nature. So why would we pave over paradise, open space, and recreation land? Why would we not care about the riparian buffer zone and our banks of our rivers? Isn't that why we moved here? Um, so why is Dorothy Ford Park open space parcel being combined with Ford Field parcel and then labeled a gateway? Please explain why you want the gateway. Does the housing laws give you more flexibility to label it a gateway? I think the public deserves to know exactly what a gateway means in California law. If we are not touching Ford Field, why is Ford Field listed at 20 units per acre? These two parcels should remain separate, in my opinion. If the Ladera Church wants nine units and they're part of the gateway, why is the town proposing 20 units per acre on that parcel and adding the gateway to them? What can the town do to protect Ford Field in perpetuity? We have 600 kids playing on the field every year. I know Susan Ford is interested in this answer. Conservation and open space submitted letters uh, not supportive of using open space and Ford Field. Our Ford Field is recreation land for 4,500 residents. We cannot upzone this land. It may not be used for this RENA cycle, cycle six, but what about seven? What about eight? Could it be used then? Possibly. Who will be on council? Who will be on staff? We won't know their decisions. 20 to 25% increase in residents is estimated. 736 residents is considered conservative. How will that affect traffic and noise and light spill on our main corridor? I believe the ISM, ISMND for the program, which means all sites and all future sites in town, and maybe you can clarify, does the program mean all future sites in town? Please clarify that. I think the mitigation should be listed as a CEQA document, not as a policy. List the fire marshal's request as mitigations that we need in our town to feel safe, reduce risks and hazards. I respect Woodside for caring about their environment and doing an EIR and a study uh, where they feel is necessary. Um, I believe a developer should pay into various impact funds that we create so we can share the, um, the impact of increases of our residents. And when I read what the- Christy, I need you to wrap up, please. Yeah, what makes me really sad is that aesthetics was not checked. Um, geo, um, Land use planning, the uh, wildfire was not checked. Utilities and service systems was not checked. Public services was not checked. Parks and recreation, noise, mineral resources. You know, we moved here because we care about these things. And I Christy, hope- I need you to wrap up, please. Okay, I hope our council cares as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Wynn Ferrara, go ahead. Okay, thanks, I'm unmuted now. Yes. Okay, thank you. So first of, uh, first of all, on, on behalf of my father and me, I wanna once again echo uh, my earlier thanks to all of you. You are our first line of defense against the tyranny of Sacramento. Um, a thought comes to mind, a quote, which is be brave and mighty forces will come. You have the support of our town. I further echo the comments of the townspeople that have spoken tonight. Take the time to do this right, delay the ratification, protect Ford Field, 
You represent the town and you have heard from the town in no uncertain terms. Please defer the submission. Please allow us to buy Dorothy Ford Field Park. Um, first and foremost is our safety. Cost of infrastructure is significant as well. Please invest the resources to fight the tyranny instead and act not in fear of Sacramento and their retribution, but with courage and know again that you have the support of the townspeople. We love you guys. We appreciate you guys and we want to work with you. I do think some great points were made. Please do put um, greater effort into reaching out to the townspeople to make sure. I mean, if you put a big sign uh, at Dorothy Field and said, there is going to be a huge building here, I think you'd get a lot more outpouring and you have gotten a tremendous amount of outpouring tonight. So I hope that you will hear us because we have elected you, you represent us and um, we wanna work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I am off Zoom temporarily. Is there another hand up? There are three more. Well, Martin already spoke. Martin already spoke, yeah. So there's one more. Uh, Maida? Yeah. Maida Jones, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Thanks for taking my comment. I couldn't sign on earlier. I just want to start by saying it's been almost impossible to hear town council members, except for Craig, speak. I don't know, the, the microphone system seems to be different or something, but it's the first time in all the meetings I've attended that I've had a lot of trouble hearing, particularly the town council members. Having said that, I I do want to reiterate things that have been said before only because these are critically important to me and I think to many of my fellow town residents. The Moritz maps or map has been accepted by Woodside Fire. I, I don't know what higher level of professional acceptance it needs to get it into the town's thinking for some reason, the Cal Fire map, which is much less detailed, I, I have looked at both of them, although it's been a while, but the Cal Fire map is much less detailed and also shows fewer hazardous areas. Uh, I think it might also be older than the Moritz map. We should, without any question, be using it, particularly now that Fire Marshal Bullard has suggested that we do so. The overriding issue that has come up time and again in all the housing element meetings, which I did attend largely, has been the issue of safety. People are concerned. We've seen horrible natural disasters around us, <laughs> the latest having been water, which isn't our usual problem here, but, but surely with fire a known, a known issue and a threat and not one likely to go away anytime soon. We need to take the fire marshal's recommendations and put them front and center in everything we do regarding housing, the housing element and the safety element. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up on Zoom. Anyone, Craig, you already spoke, sorry. Thirty seconds. Go ahead. That there is even an article. I mean, there's a lot of people saying delay till we have all the facts. Ethan Varian in the San Jose Mercury wrote about a bill to limit sprawl in fire and flood prone areas of California. And there's an article that just came up a couple of days in San Jose Mercury. I think if the town can delay making final decisions that are committed to and are irreversible. There may be a lot more things coming down the pipe that are going to reverse these housing requirements for rural areas like ours that are prone to fire and floods. Thank you. Uh, there's no more, one more hand up from the, from the school. So. Speak as one more newcomer. We're on 835 West Ridge Drive. My name's Lara Code, and thank you very, very much for hearing us all. We moved here for wildlife, for 400 year old trees, for nature. I think changing the very fabric of a town or wholesale change as the other newcomer has used. I do wonder if we've looked at analogies in hiring legal teams and various other teams could re who could perhaps lobby on behalf of the town in a way that's very expert. I actually lived in Hillsborough previously 
And as a town, we took on the cell phone carriers and no cell towers went into the town because it would change the very nature of the town. And it was hard fought and you probably read about it in the press, but it, the press was all around small town takes on mighty carriers. And eventually they won and it was persistence and a constant pursuit and a lot of, a lot of experts hired, but many of the residents donated to a fund to actually create the pushback. And I do feel as though we, we, we could benefit from rather than responding to state requirements on question, could we benefit from some other experts and analogies that have helped other similar small towns in similar broad change situations which don't understand the very, the very music that a town brings. And in this case, it's the nature and the peace and the quiet. Um, and moving to removing open swaths of land and perhaps changing wildlife, um, ways that they can travel around the town would really provide a rather large change. And I am a newcomer, so I speak as one, but just my reflection from what I've been hearing this evening is there is a lot of sentiment around preserving what is so special about Portola Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Yes, thank you, and thank you for all your hard work. Um, I, I just wanted to restate the obvious. Um, I, I, I think we need to take pause here. Uh, Don Bullard has made a very, um, a very, uh, a very strong statement that the negative declaration uh, is is not possible. It's not possible because the fire uh, risk. Uh, as stated, uh, must be mitigated, must be mitigated under CEQA. I think we all need to hear that. We need to hear it firmly, uh, completely, and respond to that. We cannot, we cannot make a negative declaration in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last call for comments. I don't see any on Zoom anymore in the in this here. Okay, that is it. Thank you all for your comments. All right, we will now move on to a specific discussion of, of properties at 4370, 4388, and 4394 Alpine Road. Vice Mayor Wernickoff and Council Member Haskell will recuse for this discussion. Jeff, do you have any questions on this? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't either, so, and Mary doesn't. So I'm wondering whether we're asking him to leave so they can turn around and come back in. Can we, can we I mean, we, do they have to leave the room or could, if we if we agree that we're not gonna have any specific questions about those three properties? Okay. Mary, you're-, you're I'm fine with that. Okay, so we are we are not discussing those three properties separately. So we will there is we will just move on. We're not we're not discussing. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So now is the point that if you want to um, ask questions or actually have a discussion or suggest changes with respect to those three properties, now is the time to do it. If the three non-conflicted members do not want to um, either ask questions or discuss or make modifications, then there's no need um, for the council members to leave the room. I do not have any changes or questions about those three properties. Okay, can I believe? Nor I. Okay, can I believe we're settled on that? Okay, in that case, I will close the public hearing and we will move on to our discussion of the of the, uh, the items, the ISMNB and the vice mayor. Where, uh, anyone, anyone wanna start? Um, I had one question I wanted to ask. Um, Judith and I had a slightly revised set of topics. I mean, just uh, and literally a, a couple of small changes. I'm wondering when the appropriate time to bring that up is. Revised topics for. So the topics that we talked about last meeting. Yeah. So the basically the eight topics we had, 
Right. We just changed the wording on a couple of those. Okay. Um, and I'd like at some point to be able to present those, but you can tell me when you think that's appropriate. Um, well, actually, does any, anyone from the council want to ask either sort of take, there, we've got a lot of, we've got several comments and questions. Anyone want to take a question or anything from the public and, and ask that of staff to clarify anything right now? So we can come up. I actually have a couple. Here, yeah, let's, that, let's definitely do that first. Okay. Um, Just quickly, there was a question about Charter City. Um, Carl, can you just, just talk briefly about the process for becoming a Charter City? <laughs> briefly. <laughs> um, so the, there are two different ways to become a Charter City. The, um, uh, both methods require a vote of the people. And so it needs to go on to the ballot and you can become a charter city that way. Um, the current thinking on, on whether becoming a charter city is beneficial is that um, typically uh, it is thought that there is more um, ability to assert local control vis-a-vis -vis the state if you are a charter city. In particular, it used to be the case in the land use arena and in housing issues where um, becoming a charter city would give you more local control. That is no longer the case from a um, case law precedent standpoint. The court has held that issues of, of particularly housing are matters of statewide concern, not local control. And so, um, it, it becoming a charter city has, has no benefit for the issues that really at this point that we're talking about. That being said, the law tends to fluctuate like a pendulum back and forth. And so at some point, you know, it, it might be appropriate for the town to consider uh, becoming a charter city. But at this point, um, I don't see any benefits uh, with respect to housing law. And it would, it would take months or years to, to go through the full process is that do i understand that correctly yes um it, it takes it, 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 at least a year or two okay. um and one other question um just to clarify stanford w d does intend to deed restrict the the low-income housing on its on the portola terrace property right okay thank you um There'll be 12 units um, that are counted yeah. in our housing inventory towards a lower income. Do the four, do the market rate units have any deed restrictions on them? The market rate units would be designated for their faculty and they have their own system where they offer the units at a reduced rate to their faculty but they would not be deed restricted um, for town purposes. Oh, uh, you mentioned the Huntington Beach, most recent finding on the Huntington Beach, and they challenged the constitutionality of, of the, the reallocation. And was that, they were challenging the California constitution or the US constitution or both? I think they brought both a, um, there were 11 causes of action. <laughs> and so they threw in a lot of different causes of action. I believe that they asserted a federal uh, due process, equal protection, as well as a state due process. And the, the most recent ruling was a, it wasn't an actual court finding or was it a dismissal of the case? I can't remember. It, it was a, a temporary restraining order. And in order to grant a temporary restraining order, a judge has to make a finding that they are likely to proceed on the merits. And so the same judge that will be ruling on, that, he was, that ruled on the TRO will presumably rule on the merits of the case as well. And so generally those preliminary decisions can be dispositive. Um, in the case, although the judge is not required to, to, the judge is permitted to change their mind once additional evidence and arguments are made. Could, could you clarify that? Did you say they got a restraining order or they didn't? 
the restraining order uh, was denied. Denied. Okay. Thank you. There was no. Yeah, that, 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 that seemed like the content of what you said, but I thought you said at the beginning they got a restraining order. I couldn't rectify it. So. Does anyone else have any questions that they want to ask? Um, I'd like to better understand. So we adopted, well, I don't adopt is the right word, but we've included the CAL FIRE map in the housing element. My understanding is we then also included the Moritz map in part of our discussion. Did I miss? I, I thought a while back we did that. That's um, correct. And so then this, I forget the exact numbers for but it's sort of 23 to 84%. I'm sure I don't have that quite right, but I have roughly the range um, that we've sort of opened up to sort of lower um, mitigation, so to speak, more, more risk. Um, I guess I'm, I'm troubled because I thought we also got from Zeke Lunder, who's a fire expert, who said for the particular sites um, with vegetation um, mitigation that he didn't see that those are an issue. So I, I'm, I feel like there's some conflation between the overall safety issues in the town, which I understand, and, and presumably we're going to address those with the safety element, versus the issues within the housing element. I wondered if you could help clarify that for me a little bit. I think there is some um, conflation of those issues. Um, the Moritz map is included in the housing element. Um, it was part of the ad hoc housing element committee's review. Um, I think there are some people who think that the housing ad hoc housing element committee should have considered it more, um, but the committee did consider it. Um, we did map the um, Moritz map with the housing element sites. Um, there is a table that includes the categorization of those different sites. Um, some of them are high. Um, or you know, portions or highest category that is included in this version of the housing element. Um, so is that is that helpful? Does that yeah, answer the you. question? Yeah. That was my other um, quick clarification. If you know. well, yeah, the Mortz map is uh, page hundred and three. Other other questions. So circling back to the fire marshal's request, I am confused what he's actually asking for because I've heard that he wants the resolution and will be presumably satisfied with the resolution, which essentially says good faith consideration. Um, and yet I'm hearing others say, put it in the MMRP. So, so can you clarify exactly what we know about what he wants, whether it's, you know, and clarify whether it came through council or him, because when he spoke, I have written down that he said that must be included and enacted, must. So I'm getting confused. But that was in the safety element is what he said. Or yeah, no, yeah, or ordinances. Right. Ordin right. Um, so, yeah, um, we have had several conversations with the fire marshal, um, and I think that the, the fire marshal um, is obviously has his area of expertise. Um, and so, you know, um, fire preservation and protection issues are certainly within his purview. He has informed us that he does not have a lot of CEQA expertise or legislation expertise. I would not expect a fire marshal to have that type of expertise. You know, very unusual for a fire marshal to do that. Typically, lawyers um, draft that type of legislation. Mm -hmm. So um, when Talking just recently, um, the fire district did retain a, um, a new lawyer uh, that specializes in CEQA because the fire marshal admitted that he um, did not have that particular expertise, but that he thought it was important to bring that expertise to the conversation. 
So um, today was the first time that um, I had um, a conver several conversations with the lawyer and the lawyer informed me um, that the, according to her conversations with her client, um, the uh, you know, fire marshal, that he would be satisfied with this, res the actual language that was proposed tonight. Um, we, we went through several iterations of this language and the final language that we presented to the council tonight was um, represented by the lawyer as being satisfactory to the fire marshal. And that's the information that I have. Um, other questions? Yeah, the um, the there were some public questions on the cost of the town lawyer. Can you just cite where your you referenced but didn't show it tonight? If you just cite where that is in the packet, um, so people can look at that and have that information. In the packet is attachment 13, and that's a table with the housing element programs, um, whether they're already included in the budget or if there's an, a, a different approach that needs to be taken. If we know what the direct expense or consultant costs, that's an estimate that I've done. And then the amount of staff time, just in general categories of high, medium, or low staff time. Okay. Thank you. And I would say it's roughly on page 150 in the packet. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where it starts. You're right. I was just yeah. uh, notice where my yeah. that was the roughly part. <laughs> oh. My my probably last question is. You've had a lot of discussions with HCB and they've given you direction that SB9 units can't be used. How do we interpret that? Because obviously we've got 253 units we were aiming for with the over it. No, that's without the over it, right? Um, so how are other jurisdictions viewing those types of statements? Are they don't go there even if it's a five units out of 250, are they, like, is it a best practice versus a, uh, you know, means that we can relatively quickly predict it will be, the whole element will be balanced. I, I'm having trouble understanding how they can have such a fixed view on something like substituting a SB9 unit for, and using it as a forward planning means if it's de minimis and how do you interpret their statement um i interpret it that they think nothing is de minimis that they are serious about every single unit and they want to know where every single unit is coming for in our plan in our projection and so they issued guidance um, that was basically interpreted as unachievable um, to be able to count SB9 units. I mean, they wanted people to analyze every single property in the entire city or town and analyze whether it was possible to, to have lot splits or development on those. I mean, it was basically an impossible methodology. So um, I, I know at least Woodside took out their SB9 units last time I talked to them. Um, I don't know of other people that have kept them in unless they truly have a pattern and um, think they can project them forward, but um, I think they're still doing it at relatively small numbers. Thank you. There, there are other situations where, where they might consider SB9 units. Um, there was a Turner study that projected SB9 units in various jurisdictions. Um, the study for, for Portola Valley did not project any in Portola Valley. So that would not be particularly helpful for us. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, I think that they would look at the actual SB9 ordinance um, 
if the particular ordinance had some enhancements or some incentives to build SB9 units, such as um, Atherton's ordinance um, has an incentive for SB9 units by, I think, not counting the basements or something like that. And in fact, uh, Atherton has received um, many applications for SB9 units and is even has even approved several. So that is a situation where it's likely that HCD will um, uh, it allow for um, the, position, the projection of additional SB9 units. So an incentive might yeah, help that option. Right. Thank you. Which is what we try to do with our opt-in program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, is, is it our legal right uh, to amend the ISMND at this point? Are we, is it possible for us to do that? Yes, it would require a recirculation, um, most likely, of the ISMND. Um, and obviously, that's just a time. What does that mean? Recirculation means that it needs to go out to the public again for a 30 day uh, comment period. And then um, 30 days, not 30 days, 30 day comment period. And then we would collect those comments, respond to them, um, and republish the document. So, does that include changing the language in the ISMND? Yes, yes. In order to even change a word of the ISMND, we have to uh, do a 30 day. Uh, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. If it's just minor comments, um, then uh, we can uh, incorporate those from the dais. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, recirculating a, a whole impact category and, and re um, analyzing, for instance, the way we, we um, you know, analyze, um, you know, the land use uh, chapter itself. Um, if it's a, a substantive uh, change, then it would require recirculation, but minor modification. Are we in discussion at this point? Uh, you may, you may discuss this. Okay. Um, I agree with the uh, overwhelming number of people who spoke about the fact that it seemed that the ISMND is misleading and erroneous. Uh, and something that I, as somebody who believes in the truth, find very uncomfortable to, uh, to vote for. Um, I, it's quite obvious to me, uh, I wrote down, we also hold these truths to be self-evident. Portola Valley is acting in good faith to achieve our designated regional housing allocation. We respect, defend, and understand the surrounding environment with a deep commitment to the democratic process and recognize the need for verifiable and safe, very low, low and medium income housing in our surrounding Portola, but our, and our surrounding Portola Valley straddles the San Andreas Fault the U.S. equivalent of the, uh, of the Anatolian Fault from which the geological safety guidelines in the general plan were extrapolated because we have exactly this, the same risk as Turkey does. So, um, in, and in fact, we live in a very steep canyon area with uh, hills and we provide the majority of the water for the whole San Francisco watershed. Uh, we have a big obligation to the environment. Um, and we live in a very, and it is in an area of very high uh, and high risk for devastating wildfires. Uh, vegetation management and new home hardening cannot mitigate the explosive risk and hazard of housing. We recognize that real risk to life is at stake. Despite that, we seem to be stating that there is no significant safety factors uh, in, uh, in adding, uh, adding housing. There's no uh, significant biological resource uh, impact, and there's no significant agricultural or forestry resources impact. Uh, it seems to me that we're speaking untruth here. Uh, and, and, uh, 
if indeed we have to do that because the government says we have to do that, uh, I think we should, I, it would be my pr preference to add on a sentence that says, this is who we are, this is where we are, this is what we believe. This is real effect on the aesthetics of our town. This is not fake. Um, if we have to say this because we're being forced to by some legal um, trick, that's okay. But I think at some point we have to make a declaration and that's why I use the words, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. So um, that would be my position on, the, on this, uh, and I'm afraid I'm having a hard time getting to a point where I could consider voting for it because of the overwhelming, the, the more you read what it says, the less close to truth it is. My opinion. Oh, anyone else want to? Um, I have a question for Mary. Um, you're saying you can't vote for it, or you could if you add a sentence. And if that's the case, what would you be adding? That would be the sentence I would <laughs> I would add. I would add the full extent of our environmental uh, risk, and uh, just in turn, in, and you can say it's subjective as opposed to objective. Maybe there's some CEQA thing out there that thinks that we have no aesthetic impact of adding these housing or of developing the Ford Field. But um, I don't think as, an, as a town, we have that ethos at all. Um, so for us, it's, it's real aesthetic. It's real aesthetic impact. It's real environmental impact. It's the, it's the banks of, of the Los Trancos Creek. It's the, it's, the, it's what keeps us from flooding. It's keep, what keeps East Palo Alto from flooding. Um, there's a whole realm of environmental impact that, that is going on here and biological impact. So I, I, I mean, because we've watched the CEQA process before, it doesn't seem like the legally we have much in the way of defense, except for our own beliefs that this is that this, our own belief in science, which is that these are the real effects of this kind of development. And so would I be willing to vote for it if I could get my declaration of, uh, of ethics on there? I guess I could, but it would be probably be not so good for HCD. What can I tell you? Uh, or maybe you could put it at the end, uh, hidden under uh, something, but as it stands right now, I just can't. I just can't see it. But it, it makes sense that we're, we're saying these things are true, and that I'm putting my name on it. Well, I mean, it, that's not how I read the document. I mean, it's 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 not saying there's no impacts. It's saying that we have mechanisms in place that address the impacts. Um, it's you know, it's I mean, we have you know, we have a, a process for reviewing applications for all these things, fire safe. I mean, we we, we have pre set practices. It references those things. It references parts of our general plan, our ordinances, it references state law. It says, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is confusing that way because it makes it look, if you read it very carefully, if you read that very superficially, it looks like it's saying there's no impact. It looks, no, it looks no, like and no significant aesthetic impact. I understand, but then you go into the document and it explains why we have things in place to, to, to manage those aesthetic impacts the same way that we manage them if someone builds a house. As they have the right to do right now. Forestry resources. We're talking about taking every tree out of. Uh, we're taking a lot of trees down. We're talking about risking a lot of burning of a lot of trees as well. Um, anyway, I, I understand. I understand that I can look at it in all different kinds of ways, but uh, I don't feel comfortable with it. And I know it won't go away. So. What I was going to do was just suggest that we say who we are somewhere in the document, that we are on the San Andreas Fault, that we do have a significant safety uh, aspect, and that we just put that out there and have at least them realize who we are, that we're not just some gateway community of some sort, that we have a real obligation to our environmental resources.
I mean, the document does in fact say we're located in the San Andreas fault zone. So it, I mean, it does acknowledge that. I mean, it, you know, that you're talking yeah. about too. I, I mean, I, I understand what we you're could, saying, but I also- could, We could emphasize it more perhaps. Or okay. Put it more prominently, or maybe it doesn't need to be emphasized. Maybe I just need to read it more carefully and be. I mean, it does talk about the aesthetics and how they're important to us. I mean, and our general plan talks at great length about the aesthetics, and it, it, it references parts, I believe, of our general plan talking about the fact that it's important. I mean, I, I would argue it does say who we are to some extent. Yeah, good. I'm, well, happy I, to I mean, I, I'm looking for reassurance. Don't get me wrong. I, I that's do that's my two cents. I, I do want to get out of this someday. Um, I do, but uh, I am deeply concerned about the honesty of this. Um, I agree it's an arcane process. Well, it, I, I would say it's arcane and it's not using standard English definition. Yeah. So I think that's the thing to be careful of is, I agree, if you take it as, as plain English, then yeah, this document seems un, untrustworthy. But that's not what this document is saying. It's saying, is it significant after you take into account all the other things that we already do in this community? That's the real question here. And that's, I mean, that's the way I read it, is it's saying we have a lot of protections that we built in proactively, so to speak, because we were already thoughtful about this stuff. Whereas there's a lot of communities that don't have any, you know, they don't have anywhere the general plan or any things that we have. And as a consequence, they are kind of like, yeah, just the developers come in and do whatever they wanted. A developer, I'm sure you could ask developers, he, you know, they've tried to build in Portola Valley and they wouldn't say they got a particularly free hand. Right, <laughs> right. No, I know that. Well, I but guess I think I, we're I, opening I, ourselves up in a way, in a way to that absence of that, uh, that we're opening up a free hand. Well, I would say the, I feel like the opposite. I feel like we're trying to craft something that keeps what we think is important and if we want to open it up, we can just not do this and we can have builders remedy and we can let the state rezone the town. Like that to me is because then they could come in and say, eh, general plan, who cares? So, I, you know, that's, that's, that's this weird balance that we're in. And, I, and I, I don't disagree. This is a horrible process overall, but it does feel to me like we're actually ratifying the general plan in this, not letting the state get control and come in and say, well, you know, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a it's a flat acre. Do whatever you want. Like that's not the Portola Valley way. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you have to go through ASCC. Um, if you want to grade, you have to go through planning commission. I mean, you know, and there's all sorts of considerations that we have. So I, I would ask that you look at it in that light. Um, that's just you know, that's that's where I'm I'm currently viewing it. But I, I'm I'm with you that if you just look at it as straight plain English, it's it's hard to you know square. I also just wanted to add that I, I feel like the process that we've been through through the last couple of meetings in terms of the additions from, um, you know, the seven topics that we've reviewed, I think that's gone a long way of bolstering that. That was the request through the Planning Commission um, when they, you know, pushed the ISMND forward that we would um, really find a way to, um, uh, what's what's the... To, to get some mechanisms in place to adopt those eight items. Um, and then we also now have amendments to the MMRP. And so I feel like through the course of the last two planning commission meetings and the last two council meetings, all of our efforts have been toward further bolstering the ISMND. Um, that was the recommendation of the planning commission, which I feel like we have followed through on. Right, I was feeling pretty good about that until I started really looking closer and closer. Um, and particularly, um, as you know, I've been looking very deeply at the general plan and um, starting with the original uh, the phrase about uh, the Alpine Scenic Corridor, et cetera, and the gateway and so forth. And then I looked carefully at what we were doing with the housing. And uh, I, I've, I've actually already brought it up, but I think uh, I would be much more comfortable if we uh, deleted the gateway category altogether. And if it's really, and I would consider putting the whole gateway, the whole Alpine scenic corridor 
substitute the word alpine scenic corridor for gateway and go back to the original. So we're not even adding another, another whole category uh, and call it the alpine scenic corridor uh, if you like. But I was thinking that we could change one and two could be one uh, of the different. The, the Mary, different do you mind? Which, Where which are one you and two are you looking at? I'm, I'm... We are at 2106 of the standards. Residential areas are shown in eight land use intensity categories. And I didn't see any reason why we should have both a gateway a category and a multifamily medium category. I thought we could have a one. We could go back to the original designation of an alpine scenic corridor and at least keep in mind that's what we're doing. We're not doing a gateway uh, complex from uh, from Ladera all the way to Portola Road. We're doing a we're doing the best we can to maintain an alpine scenic corridor in the context of of legislation. So. Um, I didn't see a reason why we couldn't just drop the gateway name completely and just incorporate one and two into one, which is uh, by just saying multifamily, medium income, media, I thought low to medium income on existing developed and undeveloped areas where density is no more than 20 dwelling units per acre. These areas are generally uh, geologically stable and relatively level terrain and have good accessibility. So uh, I didn't see why we needed two different categories and, and I didn't see why we needed to create a gateway category. So, so Mary, I, I was on the planning commission when we came up with that, so I can speak to it a little bit. Um, the goal was to basically align Ladera um, and Ford Dorothy Ford Park and open space um, for a particular reason to give the maximum, if we get pushed to developing, developing that, to have the potentially the maximum flexibility. Because one of the things we heard at the Planning Commission was that for a low income housing developer to come in, there's a certain number of units they need to operate just to make it economic. And so the idea was if somebody came in and potentially developed both the half acre at Ladera and some portion that we might be able to, for instance, save the oaks because we could move it or make it smaller. So that was the intent behind having the gateway be this sort of group and not just say, well, they're all just separate things and they just do whatever they do. So there was some thought behind that. I mean, you can disagree with it, which is yeah, fine. Yeah, but, I, mean, but just I, I, to, but, I understood, I, I, I actually felt guilty about that because I think I might have introduced the gateway word you know, <laughs> because I was reading about the oaks and the gateway and all that. So I was sort of feeling like I was going back on my own theory, but when I look at it now and what I, I think the thing we need to assert is that we're trying to preserve our Alpine scenic corridor. And, and yes, we, we're going to do our housing things, but what we want to assert in our documents is that we believe there is such a thing as the Alpine scenic corridor. Well, that's in the general plan, so I don't think we have to reassert that. But well, we do because this is a complete nullification of it. But it's um, okay. We we might disagree on that. I I, I don't like look pretty I, bad. Okay, yeah, I think you're interpreting a word in a way that it, I don't know it, yeah. in a much we too may, strong way. I mean, a, a, a gateway. I mean, it's in the the words in the general plan, and that didn't offend you. We don't have to no. Extract I came it from, up with it, but I didn't capitalize it. Um, and I don't like the feeling of it being capitalized and the, and the number one category of our, wait, housing, wait. of our housing element. The number one residential category is now this gateway thing. So if we made it lowercase and made it the fourth one, it would be better? Yeah, be better. <laughs> it would be better. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it would feel yeah, yeah, better. Yeah. And, and it would have longer lasting uh, uh, sense of aesthetic. Can, can I ask a, I, I just have a process question. Yeah, yeah let's get quick. So we're, what are the different things that two we, things we're, we're, we're talking about in the future? Talking about two separate things we're doing. One is approving the adopting the ISM and D. Um, adopting the ISM and D uh, for the uh, housing and safety elements and the conforming general plan and zoning amendment. And then we're adopting the housing amendment or discussing the housing amendment. So, Maybe we come back to the ISMND first, which we sort of, we covered a lot of ground on that last week. Um, 
that. And, uh, we kind of we started the discussion. I assume Dean kind of moved elsewhere, but we'll come back. More thoughts on the I assume and Dean. Um, I mean, I will speak to. I'm comfortable with the resolution. I mean, let's see. I applaud Don um, really stepping up on the safety stuff. I think this town has been lax on safety, particularly fire safety for a long time. I think the CZU fire really kind of woke people up. And I think Don is stepped up to make sure that people are aware that, you know, we have a huge, you know, um, underlying set of issues that we need to deal with. So I do think it's critically important that we're committing to um, a timeline to work on this stuff. It can't be like, oh yeah, we might get to it. And then, you know, somehow we don't get to it. So what I liked about the resolution is I like the resolution had some dates in it and we're gonna have to discuss what those dates are. And I guess that's where I'd like to focus is, you know, what, what dates make sense um, and you know how can we kind of lock this thing down? Because I'm I'm completely on board with our you know in a sense putting some skin in this game and committing to, and and I feel like a lot of public comments I've heard are well this needs to be you know in the ISM and D, but it feels like it's more because they want to make sure it's going to get done, not because there's some there's a set of lawyers out there that really care exactly where it goes. So um, I mean not that some people aren't lawyers and they. They don't care. Some of them do, but but there feels like the the main thing I've I've taken away from this is that there's a real concern that this not get left on the table. That we finally go, oh God, we finally passed all this stuff, and we all breathe a sigh of relief and then walk away from it. So so if we could maybe think about the the time timeline on this stuff. So let's talk about the let's talk about the amendment, the um, that, that language, the resolution, okay. the, res yeah. the, res the resolution. It, no, it's it, well, it could be amended though. Resolution. So there were two versions of the Roman honor before. What is, I mean, well, take I, I, I need to see this brought up. Oh, I'll put it back on the screen. Do you not have copies in front of you? I mean, I'm happy to put it on the screen. Yeah. Copies of what? Copies no. of your slides? This is the, the resolution, the draft. Addendum to the modification of the resolution. It, whereas the, the language copies. of Fara and we didn't and have copies of that. Oh, okay. Of that. Yeah. I didn't know that. I don't know everything. <clears throat> I think this is it. Hold on, sorry. So, Laura, I'd start with my question to you: Is if we were intent on adopting the safety element, what is a reasonable honor before that we're gonna meet our commitment to the residents and to the fire marshal if we were to put this in? Since this has obviously been a land, I mean, a lot of work in your department as we're moving forward on this. Um, that's a difficult question because I've been told that the safety element is terrible. Um, and so I don't know what the council expects from the committee work going forward. Um, the staff and consultant team has drafted a safety element that complies with the law and we think would be adopted by Cal Fire. They, I mean, um, approved by Cal Fire. And so at this point, I don't know what else the community is really looking for um, that, we're, that we haven't provided. And cool. so it, it's, I mean, we've talked a little bit about a time frame. Right um, when we were looking at your post housing element adoption, um, and so that was pretty general. I'm pretty sure we put six to nine months on that, and I don't know how I could be really more specific than that without having a conversation with the council about what additional steps you want us to take on the housing element. Well, I think I'm sorry two, on the safety that's element. Good. That's that's good. Thank you. So there, because there's two two parts here. There's the safety, you know, just the safety element. I think we've agreed in past meetings and safety element in a sense is the 50,000 foot document. You know, it broadly states what the safety issues are in the town. But then there's a set of, and I'm not a lawyer, so I, I'm not gonna necessarily use all the right words, but sort of programs and policies. And it feels like, you know, of Don's, you know, seven things that he was asking, you know, that we think about sort of as mitigations, 
where do we have the discussions that we get resident input, we figure out the unintended consequences, and then basically get this stuff, you know, in, you know, maybe it's a program, maybe it's codified, uh, maybe it's ordinances, but, but how do we get to that place where we as a town actually have some enforceable safety measures? And I think, cause that's in some sense, the, the second date, no later than. So, I mean, that, that, that would be my, when I think about it, the safety element sort of the, you know, we get the 50,000 foot piece done, but then we've also got to follow up with how we're going to get these programs done and get this stuff, you know, in, into code or wherever it's appropriate. So your point about the general plan being at the high level is typically the case. So the safety element is normally going to be at a high level and it's going to be aspirational. And then it's going to include programs that are more specific. And so it's similar to the housing element, you know, has certain statements and then the zoning code implements it. So there are similar concepts that we can apply when thinking about the safety element. Um, in my opinion, one of the things that is not as strong about our current safety element is that there weren't, um, to me, there wasn't a clear like action plan or the steps that were taken um, by staff at the time to put some of those things into place. And one of the things that I've talked about with the fire marshal is that we want the programs to be more specific and actionable um, so that we everyone has a better idea of what to expect this time around than from the past safety element. So that's something that I think is important and would recommend. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the community is looking for um, in its safety element right now. And so that's why I'm struggling a bit. I, I wish I could give you a strong answer. Well, do you consider the programs part of the safety element or not? The safety element has its own programs. Okay. Yes. So it, to take Don seven um, you know, points here, I'm, I'm not sure what to call them. Um, how do you envision that these would get reviewed by sort of appropriate um, citizenry as well as commissions and council? Like, how would we go about saying, okay, look, Don, we've looked at this stuff, we've decided, you know, how we want to approach this, what we think is appropriate, and then here's how we're going to turn it into the, you know, sort of bucketed in the appropriate place, whether it be in the code or some other place. I mean, how does how does that pro how do you see that process working? Because that's I think that's really what I'm trying to get at. If if the safety element has programs that cover all this stuff, and we have to your point, you know, programs that are actionable, and the actions get us all this stuff, do you see that all happening in the six to nine nine month time frame? To write the programs, certainly. Okay. Maybe not to implement the programs into the high level of specificity. Okay. But if you directed staff to take these seven items back to our consultant team and do our best to make them into actionable programs, then that's what we would do. And then we would provide those out for public comment and we would have to decide what mechanism we want to use for public comment. But presumably back to the probably the two committees that are most involved in this work, the wildfire preparedness and um, emergency preparedness committees. Yeah, and I, I guess I personally would actually like to see some more, I mean, I'll, for lack of a better term, I'll just say some kind of town hall. I mean, in our topics, we had suggested having some public meetings that they're a little bit more free form. I mean, these particular meetings that we have here are very structured and, and the public gets three minutes to comment. And it, it's not very, in my mind, it doesn't really give the public a real opportunity to interact. Um, on some of these things. So somehow I'd like to make sure that maybe we come up with some programs, some straw men, whatever you want to call them, but then get public comment to particularly make sure that there's not unintended consequences. Because that's one thing I worry about is I look at some of these things and I couldn't vote for them today because I don't understand what they mean. So I'd really want to see them get detailed out and then make sure that the residents got an opportunity to make sure they really understood what they meant so we could move forward. Um, well, we could certainly do that if the council directed it. It's just time and, and budget and resources to do it. I just, I, I mean, some of these items are more are more detailed and specific than what I would typically think of as being a safety element. I mean, 
you know, codifying government code 11.5.179 doesn't feel like a safety element thing. It feels like an ordinance that we would do. So, I mean, how much of this actually, I mean, there's a safety element and then there's things in here that I don't think belong in the safety element. So I guess, I guess I'm repeating Troy's question, but I mean, it's, it doesn't feel like all seven of these go in the safety element. It feels like a few of them go in the safety element. Um, is that? I, oh, sorry, I, I have ahead. a follow-on comment question, which is looking at the language to your point, it says we'll contain a timeline for implementing said programs and policies. And I assume that's the piece that you're talking about. If it doesn't belong in the safety element, it goes into the more detailed ordinance. Yes. And that's the bucketizing process. Well, probably of, several ordinances. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just gonna say along those lines, it's, it's hard at this moment as we're just getting this as we sat down we need the process as you guys did. We need the analogous process of going through and saying where each of these, who owns it, where does it go, what's the appropriate timeline? And I, I personally am not comfortable doing that on the fly. Yeah. I'm definitely comfortable coming up with dates that fit into this generally to you know be able to feel good about where this language stands. And I'm you know I'm definitely comfortable. Um, you know, with good faith requirements, language, and all of that generally, but getting into the detail on the how, I don't think is possible at the 11th hour. Like, well, I think the two dates are where we're at. Yeah. I'm just trying to clarify yeah. what, what, what we'll be doing with each of those dates. Well, right. I understand okay. that. Um, I do feel like I don't know what I'm being asked to approve or not approve. Um, I have a sense of it. I have a sense that we want to commit to the fire marshal. We're going to take these things. And Craig and I had been looking at adopting a, an additional topic to be put into our deck uh, to get into that level of detail. But it quickly became clear that it's a really complicated thing yeah. to flesh out. But if we're not going to have a sense of that, and if we're not going to know how we get from here to there, then I don't know what I'm committing to in this resolution. And it's not that I'm not supportive of it. I am. It's just I learned about this at 6.30 tonight. I'm being asked to review detailed language, which I'm sure has been very carefully discussed by the attorneys. But I don't feel like I've got a good sense of where this leaves us. So. I'm not really comfortable throwing a dart at the wall to come up with these types of dates. I mean, it does say we intend to adopt, so it's not committing, but there are probably legal consequences of, you know, saying it's going to be six months and it being a year because of the process that we are planning to undertake. Uh, three public meetings goes by awfully quickly, but it, it's a time consuming process. So for me, I, I, I'm very uncomfortable doing this on the fly, even at this level, because I don't know the legal ramifications of this. So, I mean, we can continue to talk about it, and it's useful to get our uh, perspectives on it, but I don't feel that this is a really thoughtful um, process from my perspective because of the timing. And I know we're all moving as far as we can. That's not a criticism on anybody. It's just this is an important development, and I don't feel I totally understand it. Well, it's I mean it's 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 an intent, and and we I mean I think we've all I you know, I've heard council members saying for months that they wanted timelines on when we're going to do things like adopting the safety element. So I don't think we're being asked to commit to anything that we weren't already wanting to do, which is set some kind of timeline. Mm -hmm. um, I think it should be a little conservative, so we don't kill ourselves trying to meet it. But I also realize I don't I mean. Correct me if I'm wrong, Carl. I don't think there's. I mean, this. You know, saying that we intend to adopt the safety element on or before, I mean, it doesn't. I don't. I don't see a legal ramification for that. Am I wrong? Yeah, I I agree. I don't. I don't think um, because of the use of the word intend, um, and then the the second timeline. Um, again, in my conversation with the attorney, um, the. The intent behind this timeline was a commitment that the town would um, 
you know, implement them expeditiously. And so maybe one thing, you know, if you don't have enough information tonight to give specific, you know, time frames, maybe you just delete that that last clause and just end with expeditiously. That could also be an option. I think it might be helpful to have a time frame for the for the safety element adoption because mm -hmm. it right. it could just you know yeah. it, there's a lot of committees sure. that are looking at it yep. and they need to know the expectation for how yeah. it's going to be. So uh, I would be comfortable in getting rid of the no later clause. I I really like the at least as protective as the 2010 safety element because I think that at least addresses some of the concerns I've heard that somehow the new safety element is weaker than what we have. Um, and the fact that it's just being very explicit with Moritz, even though Moritz is already in the housing element, I, I'm okay with that as well, because I think anything that sort of reinforces this is, is a good thing. So I think if we, I'd be comfortable if we put in six to nine months um, on the safety element, and but that means we need to start, I know we got a lot to do, but it means then maybe council needs to dig in more, but we, we've got to start pretty much right after we get done with this. Well, we, I mean, we've, we've started the safety element process. We've distributed the draft and uh, correct, and we've, we've gotten some feedback on it. And yeah, I, and we have comments back, I think, from either all committees or all but geologic safety. The safety element needs a CEQA analysis? This covers the safety element. This ISMND oh. covers the safety element. So if we said for the, for the first how can we improve it then without a safe, without knowing what's in the safety element? Well, there's a there's a full draft of the safety element, and so there's a concept in CEQA that you can analyze it as long as your um, your description of what you're analyzing um, is enough to do the CEQA analysis. And so when we're doing CEQA analysis on a safety element, um, we look at the different impact categories, right? But there's not a lot of things in a safety element that trigger CEQA impacts the way there is in a housing element that triggers CEQA impacts. So we took the safety element far enough so that we could cover it with the same ISMND. And then if there's changes that affect the ISMND, then we have to address those later. I think we talked, did we talk about this last week? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I don't, sometimes I forget if I'm repeating myself. On the timeline, criticism of course uh, about the housing element is the mandate and the date and feeling like we didn't have enough time. And so my question um, to you guys is, you know, is just saying maybe January 1st, which would be nine months to give the long, you know, the longer the conservator, the approach, conservator yeah. Yeah. date within that range. Because I assume, you know, obviously, as we've all said, there's a lot of complicated matter, but then I don't, I don't want to put us in the position of being rushed either. Yeah. What do you think, Greg? Um, well, I mean, look, I'd sort of like to move on from the housing element and get to safety because at least <laughs> no. for me, yeah. I, right. I mean, yeah. the housing element stuff feels like stuff that the state's forcing us to do. And I understand that it's controversial and none of us sort of like where we're being pushed around. But I look at the safety element as something that applies to all the housing we have here now and all the new housing. And it's it feels urgent to me. So I kind of like six to nine months because I'd like us to be pushing towards six. And if it then drags because we get a lot of good public input, then it turns into nine. But I think if we aim for next year, then we'll end up saying, oh, and we got a lot of good public input. And then who knows, it could be you know April. Again. And, and I don't know for sure, but I just, I, I find that you know having bracketed dates where it's like, People who want to push, you push for the early date, and then if you don't quite make it, you slide into the later oh, date. But if you hold the later date, as we did with this process, <laughs> maybe. About, what about how about October first? Um, for the have, we say we said we tend to adopt the safety element on or before October. 
that gives us the spring and the summer is always hard to get things done, but then by September, everyone's back and, and can move on. And so then it's seven months and it gives you it goes sort of a couple months right, or a month or two at the end where people are around and we can hopefully finish up. And if for some reason we don't meet that deadline, we've got two more months before the end of the year. So you're proposing October to January, is that the, the range? I'm No, I'm saying, I'm saying we, on or before October 1st. Okay. We shoot for that. Okay. That's our intent. And then if we don't make October 1st, there's still a chance, I mean, depending on the outcome. I mean, Get it done before the end of the year. We could, between, between September and November, we could probably have a few meetings and do what we have to do. And okay. Maybe even the mid is what we could do this. Um, okay, I mean, I I think that's supposed to be between six and nine months. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I, yeah I, well, I, and I, also gets hard to add meetings in November and December. Yeah. Um, Laura, is that Tara, is that is that something is that feasible? In terms of, could we? Do you think we could have something ready by October first? I think we could have ready something ready by October first, unless there are several community wide meetings. I think we only have one planned. It takes about a month just to yeah. um, plan a community-wide meeting. Yeah. That, that's one community-wide meeting that's what you're saying? I mean, we will have other meetings of other committees. Yeah, I guess what I've been toying with, and I'm, I'm not sure, so this is a little brainstorm here from the dais, so take it for what it's worth, is, um, you know, if we had a council member, a planning commissioner, and maybe a citizen or two on a small group that could work with Don to try to turn this stuff into more actionable stuff with obviously some consultation with Laura, but to buffer Laura a little bit from this process and let that group gather more public input. So, and then we could have one just generally public meeting, but, but I just, I feel like one public meeting is not enough, but I totally understand with Laura that these broad sort of charrette like things are hugely expensive and and maybe not even that useful in the sense that we only get so many people that show up i mean because that's the problem with one if you can't make that one date then you're kind of out of luck whereas i'm thinking if we had this smaller group of people that were out there gathering information yeah. um that we could start in you know i mean literally we could start now um and we could start pulling all the stuff together. And I, I mean, I know we've got some interesting citizens in the you know, hall tonight. So, and it feels like if we had planning commission representation and town council representation without turning it into a Brown Act, <laughs> that I think we could work with Don and get a long way towards something that when we got back to Laura, she could say, okay, great. This is, you know, this is a lot tighter. And then she would tighten it up to make it good public policy, and then we could have a public forum. That I could be comfortable with that. I, I don't know what it, I'm again. I'm kind of making this up. I'm curious. Like that. I mean, I think it's a good plan. Just um, I, I I keep getting back to the idea that that uh, we're putting housing in there, and all of a sudden we're redoing the safety element after the housing, and we know that that's a major conflict. Um, and we're going to be stuck with having a housing element that doesn't fit our safety, our safety uh, plan. Um, and that's, that's what's sort of scary. Um, that being said, I, the other comment I wanted to make is I think um, geology has always been the, the, the most important feature in our uh, safety planning. And it's particularly important if we're doing, having more housing and if we are ignoring modern geological advances, we are uh, going to get in trouble with our housing. Um, and we're, we're, there's some evidence that we, as you know, have ignored uh, geological significant uh, features in our community. And uh, fire and earthquake, as we know from 1906, is a huge problem. Uh, and something that we absolutely have to uh, mediate against. So Mary, can I ask you, the, the thing I don't understand about the first part of your comment was that if we do the housing element, that somehow then we do the safety element, and but we're screwed because we already did the housing element. I mean, my intent with the safety element, it applies to every house in Portola Valley, whether it's new housing or, you know, you know, whether it's housing that's on our inventory 
or it's an empty lot that somebody wants to build that has nothing to do with the housing element meeting the state mandate, that all the safety stuff needs to apply. Because if, I, I mean, I'm a big believer, if you wanna make the biggest impact, we have 2,500 existing homes. If you wanna make an impact, there's more leverage on impacting those than there is on the 250. I'm not saying we don't do both, but to me, I'm assuming when we get a safety element, we apply that across all this new housing. It's not magically going to get a pass. Does that make sense? I hope so. Well, I, I, I certainly hope so. And I and I assume so. I, okay. I just want to guarantee that that's the case. Well, I think if we pass a safety element that applies to the town, it applies to housing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, we also have a safety element in place that actually does. I mean, a lot of our a lot of our current development standards stem from the safety element. So I feel like we, we, yes, we, are, we 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 did the housing element first, but we, it's not that we don't have a safety element in place. It's just we, it needs updating, but we have it. Yeah. yeah. Where, no, where in the process of the safety element might it become necessary to revisit the ISMMD? Because there's a little bit of a feedback loop <laughs> here, right? Uh, that you you right side the ISMND for the housing element, and then you do the safety element. And I'm trying to look forward and say, where might that get complicated if certain things change in the safety element, for example, widening roads, then when do we need to do another environmental study? I mean, I wanna be very practical about this. Do you know? Can you um, yeah, we would normally look at that when we were in the kind of the um, close to adoption of the safety element. So think about it kind of like a getting towards a final draft. Um, and then, you know, at, we have all of the same team working on this. So that's the really good part about it. So if we start to have policies that come up that start to trigger changes to the ISMND, you know, our team could be thinking about that and evaluating that along the way, but the formal review would be when we were kind of, like I said, final draft form. And then we take a look at it. We go back to the CEQA checklist and our analysis and see if anything has changed. And then if it has, the normal process is to do an addendum to the ISMND and discuss anything that's changed um, and if anything else we need to consider. And that would require recirculation for comments if they were material important. Yes, right. recirculation if there were material. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, we have to see what the results would be. I mean, there's always a possibility that further environmental re would be required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Mary, I think the point of that was more there is a need to update the ISMND later um, if something changes in the course of safety. Given the types of things that are recommended here, I would be surprised if there wasn't something, but we don't know today. Now, there, there's a route there. Um, you do have to start somewhere and, you know, if we are intending to leverage the ISMND for the safety, we got to circle back at some point. So, okay. So it sounds. Like, I think we've. I think we're comfortable with October first as the date to go on the first one. Okay. Okay. And then the second date, we could either just not say no later than, or we could set kind of a very conservative goal and say something like no later than. You know, give ourselves an extra, you know, year from when we adopt the safety element, or, or we could just leave it all. Well, I mean, part of this depends on what we don't know what the fire marshals. Are. Well, also, fire marshal Bullard, I presume, still that's a change from his blessed language. So we don't know whether that would be acceptable, or do we, Carla? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a request on, on his mm -hmm. behalf. Yeah. His, his, the intent of making this request is that it's okay. 
and and what we're saying in this language, if we even if we leave out the end no later, then we're still saying that the safety element itself will have that timeline. So we could actually flesh out the timeline for the this program. And these, this a lot of this stuff would be the things that we'd actually outline as part of the safety element. But yeah. we'd have a little, and we, we could leave out the no later than and just say that we're going to the safety element will contain. This. And we're committing to putting this yeah. on a timeline, and it's not committing a timeline tonight. We're committing the timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to get plenty of input on the expeditious part and i'd like to lead you know I'd, I'd like not to try to put a date on it now because i think it's going to depend on what these Police. programs look like and what the how much time it takes to you know so we're, we're saying there's going to be timeline and we're going to do it expeditiously and i would leave it at that i'd, I'd like the idea of just okay. and get rid of the end no later than yeah one date so october 1st and then october 1st and it, and it will contain the timeline for the program I mean, we're, we're keeping the timeline Um, I was just going to say that I think the uh, general plan discussion group has been a very interesting and positive forum for, for reaching out to people. We've got a very active group of 25 people who are about to start on the safety element, like, uh, you know, next month. And they, they're they interested and they're, they're asking difficult questions and they're coming up with good solutions. And I think if you if you publicize that as something that they can come to once a month, you've already got your public input. Those are the people who, you don't need to get every single citizen to come in and talk about safety. We're not gonna get every single Yeah, every because yeah. really, but to, to actually feel, have people getting almost bored with talking about safety, it's a wonderful thing. Well, yeah. I mean, and again, the point is, is not to get every single citizen. The point is to give every single citizen an opportunity. Yeah. And, and that yeah. comes through. I mean, the community meeting to some extent, you know, one community wide meeting would give other yeah. extent. And, and frankly, but the discussion group is community wide. Well, I, mean, I agree. We, we, I agree. I'm not I'm supportive of you doing there. that. I'm not, not, not trying to. Well, not, we not we need to, to probably put it out there more when we get going over the okay. And we probably need to do it in the. So, in the, in the meeting, so I think we've got language here for this resolution. Yes, and, and then the other comment that I heard come up um, was how to address successor maps. Um, so this is not the most artful of language, but keeping the structure of the recital, you could just tag on to the very last uh, sentence. Um, which reads, the town will also adopt the Moritz map as a basis for evaluating the fire risk associated with specific sites in the town, and then insert until the council adopts a successor map. I mean, we could even keep the Moritz map and just so put it alongside the successor map. In addition map. to it. Or is that, would having two, I mean, would having the Moritz map to supplement us, if, well, Cal Fire comes out with a map late this year. Just keeping the Moritz map somewhere in here, does that create any kind of conflict? I mean, can we look at both to evaluate? We won't so, know today. I mean, you know, like it depends on what the nature of that other map really is. You might want to consider both if they're complementary. You, if one's just super updated relative to Moritz, you might just want the updated Moritz version. So is there a way to plan in that flexibility? That, the Morris map in the near term, um, and we'll continue to evaluate best map to use on a continual basis or something. I guess one one thing is pulling from um, uh, Bullard's mitigation document. He does says Morris map or any successor map approved by the council. So, mm -hmm. what would be what would be the reason not to just go with that language? I was just saying we could keep, I mean, we could we could keep the Moritz map for reference. I mean, we, the Moritz map kind of is for reference. Right. In the safety element, so. It could say and or, I mean, like I, I don't want a false choice that we must replace. That's, that's my that's, Yeah, that's fine. I agree with you. Yeah. Okay, so then the town will also adopt the Moritz map and or a, more yeah. current map, any successor map, and or a successor map, and or any successor map approved by 
by and, and in this case, hands. it says by the district in the town. I'm not, but I think we're saying the town in this case, right? Because this is our resolution. Mm -hmm. Well, I assume that he, I assume that John wants us to read it. Sounds good to me. Are you okay with that, sir? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. A map that we agree on with the district. Um, I have one more controversial thing to say, and then I'll uh, okay, then. Uh, I'll I'll I'll, right I'll cut it. Okay. Um, I would really like to see this whole discussion of maps and um, and database become depoliticized. I don't. I it's very upsetting to me that it became a of a, a political football, uh, whether we used a Maritz map or a, uh, and I would just. I'd like to say here now. Let's stop it. Notice <laughs> and that. and and Agreed. geologic. The geological thing is the same. You know, we're not muzzling the Ge geologic safety committee. We're not. Uh, if they have questions, they get to get them answered. They get to look at the answer. They get to talk to the geologist. They they. We're not trying to tell people don't pay attention because it's their safety and it's their health. Thank you. I think that sentiment is, makes sense. Um, to me, the best science needs to dictate. Yeah. And what that is deserves discussion. I mean, experts have to weigh in. They have to guide the discussion. That's right. The people have to have their questions answered, and people have to make decisions yeah. based on the best information available. Yeah, the only thing, and, and the only thing I'd add is, and we don't have to get into the details now, but I'd like to see it be similar to the geologic safety program, which is basically a homeowner, you know, somebody who owns some property could come back and say, look, this map is wrong and here's why. And we have some way, like we do with geologic safety. Yeah, well, sorry, what, are you talking about the resolution? Or are you talking about well, I'm, I'm basically just talking about this, the, the fact that we have these hazard maps. And, may, and maybe it's just going to be, you know, part of this later process. But I think in this later process, we have to have some way of resolving issues on the map, like we do with the geologic map today. So, but but we don't have to in this resolution. I wasn't trying to get it down to that I, level. I'm, I'm sorry to derail it, but I just think that there is a sort of a, a, a there's a, a, a sort of a body of unshared information about what's happened to with the fire department, et cetera. And I just think we don't want to do that anymore. Okay. Oh. oh, I just was wondering, do we need to, what is the process to, I mean, do we have to adopt this or what's the formal? Yeah. I think we've I, got language for this resolution and then it goes into the road stuff. So the only, um, a question that we still have on this resolution. I was I was comparing the original staff recommendation was to include the council subcommittee topics one, two, and five through eight um, into the post housing element plan. But I think that recommendation was updated in the um, presentation this evening. To one, two, three, and five. So, if somebody could confirm that, that would be helpful. I see okay. one, two, three, and five in the staff report. The staff report. Okay. Appropriate to put in uh, page, uh, page, four page four of the four. staff report. Page, page five of the that. packet. Page four. Uh, I, I mean, so I'm confused. Where where are we proposing these tips? So give us.
Well, no, it's one, two, three, and five on on Bullard's 